always uh, the, the rows are a little bit emptier, but I know that on the second day only the people are there which are really interested in the topic. So I think we have a really good dynamics for today. Um, for the second day, like always in these conferences, the, um, the setup is a little bit different. Um, while on the first day you are mostly reporting on what you're doing and what the context and the concepts behind the topic of inner urban landscapes and its transformation in the Athens context are, um, on the second day one typically wants to work on it and saying, well, we want to produce an outcome which then can help us to define what will be the next steps, what would be the, uh, the big challenges we have to overcome in a follow-up project. And this is what we actually want to do. Uh, for today and for not forgetting what the city of Athens in its uh, in their planning strategy is already uh, doing we think it's good to start with a short presentation of two of the colleagues of the documentation and planning studies department um, of uh, roads sewage and public spaces division in other cities it would call the infrastructure department of the city um, and so they um, uh, decided to choose for two projects which they will show us in a very, let's say, brief presentation as a kind of basis where we can start our discussion from. Then we start with a, a session led by, um, by Tassos Ruides and uh, Panita Karamenea, uh, where we talk about uh, remaking of the city or the making of the city from planning to implementation. A lot of colleagues which already did, um, contributed to the book publication, to the many conferences we had before are here. Uh, and I'm very happy that you're again discussing with us about a future project because this also shows a certain trust that these things are meaningful what we're doing here. But we also invited some uh, new people from other universities in Greece, from other cities in Greece, from other fields. Then I think we should have a short break and we invited Georgine Theodore of uh, New York. Uh, she runs the office in Taboro and um, she's professor in New Jersey. Um, uh, I know her for quite a while. Uh, we met uh, first time in Rotterdam Biennial, Biennial in 2009. I think she's doing at her chair and also in her office extremely exciting project at the border of architecture planning, landscape architecture and art intervention. And I think this could be a pathway where we also could um, catalyze some, let's say, creative uh, uh, intervention uh, here uh, in Athens. And I learned also that she obviously has some very strong links to Greece, not only because of, uh, of projects she made here. And I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Then we'll have a short break. And afterwards, uh, there is a second session uh, led again by Tasso. So you learned yesterday he's in project lead, so he's taking over the responsibility also for uh, collecting the ideas for the next phase. Um, and Yorgos Lalios, who is uh, um, um, helping us with moderation, and I'm really looking forward what the session of governance and urban regeneration is talking about. So maybe we have to find new ways how to bring all these ideas together we talked about. You already learned yesterday from the panel discussion that maybe a tricky thing is to bring the different perspectives together and that by means of moderation or by involving third party, maybe even students or something like that, there would be a possibility to come to a kind of joint commitment for, for this project of the future. And then in the end, Panayotis Tonikiotis and myself as the, the old man uh, will make a resume in the end and want to try to tie everything together so that we can do a kind of reporting also to the outside world and it's our duty then to develop also a kind of proposal of the, the projects for the future. Thank you Panayotis that you're willing to do this with me because this is also I think a good, um, good sign that you trust us and that this kind of um, um, collaboration is very productive and that's really fun to do this project, otherwise we would not do it. But now I want to leave the stage to Ekaterini Thiamesi, sorry for the pronunciation, I'm really bad with these names, and Evangelia Krali, the two representatives of the city. The stage is used, let us know about the two projects you selected for presentation. I'm looking forward. Architecture is the masterly, correct, and magnificent play of forms brought together the lights at the Le Corbusier. 
Under this uh, perspective, we should also examine the neighborhood of the city of Athens, the role of the neighborhood as a microscale element of the city, its relationship with its inhabitant, as well as the investigation of the spatial and social characteristics that make up the concept of the neighborhood. The urban environment changes more rapidly than any other forms of human formation. It is also clear that the neighborhood as a form is much more complex than the right of group access to the resources in the right of entire social base to change and redefine it according to its wishes. Through the processes of coexisting and survival, mutual respect and um, solidarity Come, uh, combined it with identification of the characteristic that will make it sustainable and inclusive in terms of uh, accessibility, economical development and gender equality in order to fully exploit its vital contribution to the sustainable development of the city. The achievement of architectural equality is of utmost importance since attractive features that modern neighborhood can have such a square park, playground, the appropriate choice of material, the improvement of um, transportation system to channel local and intercity traffic, the enhancement of green infrastructure on pedestrian street, sidewalk park, square, and in public space in general, improve the overall quality of life and the sustainability and livability of the neighborhood. We recognize that the city and neighborhood face unprecedented threat from unsustainable forms of uh, consumption and production, uh, loss of biodiversity versus of ecosystem, form of pollution, natural and anthropogenic disaster, such a global warming. For the sustainable spatial planning of neighborhoods that we add up to the sustainable spatial planning of the city of Athens, it is necessary to put in practice by a climatic design and sustainable architectural planning strategy and objective to utilize efficiently environment indicator and criteria that will ensure that the design and implementation will achieve sustainable development through monitoring this indicator and the inhabitant reaction to the blue and green and the infrastructure of the neighborhood. And through the monitoring and the change in commuting patterns and the respecting greenhouse gas emission, the municipality will be able to interfere at local level so as to ensure, in practice, the green development of neighborhood both and architectural and at mobility level. Athens is divided into seven municipal communities. Each one of them has many neighborhoods. There are several common characteristics among them, mostly due to the way the city historically has expanded but there are also many differences. Thus, there are many parameters to be taken into consideration when designing a project for the city. One of the main aspects taken into account is climate change and the effort to create landscapes that can adapt to the new climate conditions, which are expected to be even more extreme in the near future. The emphasis here is the blue and green infrastructure, cool structural materials, and the creation of ecosystems that were for long extinguished in Athens focusing on the diversity of plants and insects in green spaces. Another main aspect concerns the inhabitants and their everyday life. This is even more complicated, and the design has to make many changing variables into account. Another aspect that we have to take into consideration is to design spaces that everybody can access and eliminate the difficulties for disabled and aged people. Accessibility and walkability are in the top priorities of the municipality agenda much effort is still needed to reach these targets. These issues have been born with the creation and growth of the city. 
Sometimes the picturesque, ancient and medieval neighborhoods tourists visit consist of narrow streets and pavements that, that cause difficulties for both pedestrians and disabled people. Next, we will present two projects that demonstrate our efforts to sustainably transform communal spaces of neighborhoods and to improve the quality of life through neighborhood design by putting in design and practice blue and green infrastructure and the transformation of vehicle to active mobility by displacing the car in walkable areas. The first project, as you can see, is Armenian Square in the neighborhood of Neos Cosmos, above the junction with Caliroi Street, which is a busy highway at a much lower level than the square. During the Olympic Games of 2004, a huge metal construction, which was meant to be a vertical garden, was placed at the border of the square towards the busy street, accompanied by a large fountain at its facade towards the road, so that it offered a view for vehicles in Caliroi Street, the view of a vertical garden and the fountain. Behind this showcase, old apartment buildings at Armenian Square had been hidden. People who lived there were completely cut off from the surrounding space, the square was abounded and became space of illegal activities causing insecurity to the inhabitants. The redesigning of this urban landscape was strongly requested by its residents and the whole community. The project, sorry, the project we will present was designed and constructed by the municipality's technical services. The new design was based on the idea of revealing the square the buildings and the people of all the neighborhood and create a public space that everybody could enjoy. The huge metal construction was demolished and the huge fountain was deconstructed. It was replaced by a construction on, of in-floor water jets and flower beds. The idea was of a square full of trees and also benches under the shade of a pergola. Routes for blind people in the square and ramps at the surroundings enabled the movement of disabled people. The second uh, project that we will present is Tosic and Zosimadon Street. The scale of this project is larger. This is including in one of the four projects that was founded by NCFF and designed by the company ADK with the consultation of the municipality's technical services. The project includes the widening of Tosic Street pavement and turning Zosimadon Street to a pedestrian street. Zosimadon and Tosica Street are in, ex are in ex are streets in Exarchia neighborhood. Zosimadon has narrow pavements around one meter width. Tosica is a two-way street and cars are parked on both sides. Although its pavements are not that narrow, around three and a half meters, in order to promote active mobility, increase green infrastructure and decrease the circulation of vehicles in the neighborhood, pavements are widened displacing parked and moving vehicles, leaving only one traffic lane. The design attempts to create a green corridor, which will unite the Archaeological Museum and NTUA, both emblematic 19th century buildings, with Strephis Hill. Here, the main action is to focus on pedestrians and to lower vehicle traffic. To succeed that, the street is turned into a one-way street and pavements are widened. We can distinguish four zones in the design of pavements. The first is between buildings and existing tree lines. The second is among existing trees. This is also the zone where benches are placed so that pedestrians can sit under the shadow. The third is the zone between existing tree lines and new tree lines that are planting. And the fourth one is the zone with the new tree lines, which are designed in such a way that are also connected with another ground draining system for rainwater. Tosica Street's redesign is combined with the transformation of Zosimadon Street into a pedestrian street, making a walkable route which promotes active mobility from the two monumental buildings of NTUA and the Archaeological Museum to the green space of Strefis Hill, putting together the visual and functional integration of green infrastructure into the urban environment. And uh, here to say that uh, the architect uh, of uh, ADK that made this project is uh, Tsagaraki Daria, and uh, Dreiselt Herbert was the consultant on green and blue infrastructure. Thank you very much for your attention.
added two elements to the discussion which are really important. The first one is that um, not all the projects happen on a very large scale, but you have to find the right scale, which is the neighborhood scale, and sometimes the projects are really small and maybe also very peripheral in a way that they are not in the city center only, and I think also showing the sectional drawing of the street profile was very instructive because planting trees and reorganizing streets is a hell of a business because there is so much in the underground and it's not only physical infrastructure but for example also lines of property who owns the land etc and I think it's good to see this also as an additional challenge which is often forgotten in the discussion about how to reorganize the city space thank you for that but now I'm handing over over for the third session to, um, to Panita Karamanea and Tassos Roides. I'm looking forward um, to your panel. Thank you, Mark. Panita will do Can the introduction. I, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here to the third uh, session. Um, we are welcoming you. In this session, we will explore the current approaches regarding the city making. So first of all, we would like to see how an idea, a concept, passes through the implementation and uh, at the end uh, becomes a project. So we have invited uh, Tilemachos Andrianopoulos, who is an associate professor of uh, architecture and urban design in the National School of uh, Athens in the School of Architecture of Athens, and also a founder of uh, the TENS uh, office, architectural office, with a lot of awards and uh, first prizes in competitions regarding the city, who is involved in uh, the city making of Athens uh, with projects he will show us. So first of all, uh, we're going to listen to Tilemachos. Then we have um, to explore also the involvement of people to the city making. So how the participatory design may change, may be, be a creative input to the city projects. So we have invited Irini Liopoulou, who is uh, an architect, an urbanist, and holds a PhD awarded at the Technical University of Berlin, co-founder of Simple OGP Development and Cultural Planning Services, and a postdoctoral researcher at Pandya University. Her interests include civic participation in integrated territorial development, community engagement, socio-spatial conflicts, and the cultural creative industries. That she will probably show us and explain to us her experience in uh, participatory design uh, processes. I hope through the Hydrant uh, project uh, in Athens, a very interesting project. And then we would like also to explore the big scale, the metropolitan scale, and how possible visions that we mentioned also yesterday could affect the city making. And uh, believing that uh, we have to work all together, as we were saying again yesterday, we want to um, get the experience through Lucas Triadis of um, last year's LSE uh, research program under the lead of Ricky Bardet of uh, London. Lucas Triadis is an architect from uh, the NTUA and uh, an urbanist from, uh, with a master's and uh, a doctoral uh, program. And uh, he's an assistant professor in um, Thessaloniki. And uh, he will present us uh, the last year's um, results and also will explain to us how the bigger scale can um, help and uh, give uh, the big picture of uh, the possible city making. So the floor, first of all, to Tilemachos. So, good afternoon. 
and uh, I have uh, to say that it was uh, really a pleasure contributing in that uh, workshop in the National Technical University. So thank you, Mark and uh, Tassos and Norbert for this uh, uh, invitation and uh, mainly for this, uh, it's a bit higher, for this initiative. So, um, During this uh, session, we are discussing uh, the remaking of the city from planning to implementation. So before we focus on Athens, I believe it would be appropriate to talk about Heraklion and Lausanne through, through allegories useful for what we follow. All three cases will be served by the super vehicle of uh, architectural competitions. Restoration and uh, reuse of the western arsenal of Heraklion and the broader uh, surrounding space. It was the first prize in the national architectural competition. This is the second competition organized in 2009 by the municipality of Heraklion for a national complex. It was preceded by the one in 2008 for the Eastern Arsenali, for which we also received a distinction. You counted correctly, 15 years. The design exists, but nothing has been implemented yet, neither for the one nor for the other arsenal. There is no doubt that the field is quite complex and certainly worn out, just like the Western Arsenal itself. Gradual embankments and the sweeping expansion of the coastal route left it crippled. About only half of the Venetian Galleria still exist. The proposal envisioned the restoration of the geometry of the Arsenal by creating a square as well as a geometrical reminder of the now mutilated galleries through a wooden loggia, which brings them close to the water again. The city's main pedestrian street towards the sea ends at a sloping triangular platform. Underneath it, the water passes through in order to meet the wall. The municipality of Heraklion, the port authority of Heraklion, and of course the Ministry of Culture are involved in the field. The agreement between the three appears to be fruitless, given that this ambitious project, which could restore the city's relationship with the sea for the time being, has been put aside. So just that just a restoration of the monument is realized. The previous competition was a national one. This one was international and also an ideas competition. The big difference is that the municipality of Lausanne announced an ideas competition in 2022 for the two most central squares of the city in order to have a public exhibition and discussion so that making use of the results, the project competition or competition de projet can be announced and not as it usually happens in Greece, so that the competition is a two-to-one and cost the operator certainly cheaper. However, the main goal of the municipality seems to be that the competition will actually be implemented. Let's move to the field. These are two busy and already multifunctional squares between the upper and the lower city, which are crossed by the imposing Grand Pont with intense height differences and with multiple connections on two levels. Our proposal reinforces them through the creation of a connection verte, a green curved promenade that joins the two dominant existing buildings. 
but it is also about a complex interchange where city bus lines, subway lines, and a commuter's line meet. Just a look at the awarded proposal suggests that the projects that ultimately won are relatively timid. The competition's experience for us has two notable aspects. Firstly, we received a conversation, and even an express one, because the proposal was simply judged to be one of a high standard. This would never happen in Greece. Secondly, we received an email from an anonymous citizen saying, just paid a visit to the expo related to that competition here in Lausanne, and I liked a lot your project. Sad that it was not selected for the final round. I didn't read the rules program for this competition, but the winners offer nothing special. Too bad municipality was not more ambitious. Your project did remind me the Green Line New York, Coulet Vert in Paris, or the Seoul Sky Garden on a much smaller scale, but that would have been a start. Anyway, all projects that did show some ambition got eliminated. Weird. I know compositions are frustrating. Hope to see your work again, including in real life. The indications so far are that our Swiss friend could actually see a realized project of ours for public space in real life in Athens. Third competition, also international, for the regeneration of the center of Athens, first prize. Organized in 2019 by the Ministry of Infrastructure and Athens Annapolis SA, I consider it an absolutely fortunate event and perhaps quite quick for Greek standards that following the competition, the study of a part of the city center, that of Ermou Street from Capnicarea to Thysio, has just received approval from the Council of Modern Monuments and is heading towards its implementation. It was preceded by the Central Council of Architecture and also by the approval of the Technical Service of the Municipality of Athens, with mostly fruitful observations. But if we return to the general picture, it was a complex and ambitious competition that was focused in the 19th century historical neoclassical triangle by Cleanthes and Schaubert. Apart from a master plan, the competition urged for the selection of three out of nine sites to intervene. The proposal transforms three pivotal nodes of the Athenian center, Syntagma Square in front of the parliament, Varvakius Square in front of the public market, Keramikos at the western edge of Ermou Street next to the ancient cemetery. The three restructured poles inten intensify the character of the public spaces that incubated them, Civic Square in Syntagma, Market Square in Varvakius, Recreation Square in Keramikos, Rectangle, Square, Circle. Three simple ge new geometries accompanied by crucial traffic, functional, and geometric arrangements attempt the recovery of public space and the reactivation of the axis of Athenas and Ermo. From all the above, however, the two that I consider to be of an urgent priority are the particularly problematic square in the middle of Athenas at Varvakius Market and the long-suffering, also middle part of Ermou, which the municipality itself has already initiated and is heading to implementation. I propose to end with the hot issue of implementation. How can a competition for public space give as a follow-up a valid study, even if it's partial in relation to any broader vision? which may lead to a su successful realization. I believe there are conditions 
specific conditions. Let's name them. One, if according to the title of our session, we are talking about the remaking of the city, the architectural proposal must be elaborated in depth, but must also be bold. Otherwise, the game is already lost. Two, if the jury should not be nerveless or moderate the goals of the competition organizer, there is no direct connection between proposals that are simplistic and their supposedly increased feasibility. Three, the involved organizer or municipality, in our case, must strengthen any effort to investigate the city's issues in a structured manner, as it was done with the preservation and development of Athens and Atlas's essay that continued its course under a different government. Four, the authorities that will approve or propose amendments must do in so in a spirit of cooperation, in contact with reality, and above all, with efficacy. Everyone's main goal must be the in due time construction, not the redistribution of foolish affiliations of power. Before the brief moral of the story, a pleasant, I hope, break with an animation video of the three, three wannabe realized designs. Sorry, the video doesn't play. Uh, you didn't check if it plays. There's no, in my PowerPoint there was a video, but you didn't check it at all. What? Oh. Um, what we can do, there's no internet, there is, the video is online, but we can skip it. Sorry. I thought that you'd shake it, okay. <laughs> anyway. Okay. okay, so. Let's make a closing comment, so, without the video. If there is a brief moral to our story of these three attempts of designing or potentially implementing projects in the city, this might be that institutions, competitions, services, municipalities are certainly important, but what is the most important are the people, the exact specific persons, the specific judge who sees into and applauds the boldness of a proposal, the specific officer who sees into and reinforces the structure of a study, and the specific, let's say, mayor who sees into and promotes the implementation of a vision. For the city of Athens, it remains to be seen. As for Lausanne, or perhaps even more our Heraklion, nothing is lost yet, at least uh, that I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Tilema, yeah, very much. Sorry for this technical issue. It was working in the Mac before, but copying it. Sorry, maybe we can play it in the break. Irini Iliopoulou will continue. Ah. 
Okay, so hello everyone and let me, let me also take the opportunity to say many thanks to all the people who are uh, not only behind the symposium but the whole process because I had the, uh, the pleasure to be part of the whole process that started um, back in the December of 2021. And I have to say here that it's really, really valuable and rare to have the opportunity to meet and collaborate and work together in such a systematic way also uh, with uh, people from the academia, with professionals, people coming from the civil society and who act and do actually things within, with and for the city. So, Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be also here today. So, uh, today I would like to contribute to the discussion with an ongoing project, uh, and in my point of view also a very interesting case of an integrated and participatory approach to cultural heritage as commons, that engages local people and reactivates local cultural capital. So, in uh, June 2020, Halandri, we are going out of Athens at the moment, towards Halandri, which is the biggest city in the uh, North Athens regional uh, unit of Attica. So, Halandri in uh, 2020 was selected to implement a three-year which now is extended up to a four-year uh, development project named Cultural Hydrant. Cultural hidden identities reappear through networks of water. Funded by the EU initiative, the Urban Innovative Actions. Cultural Hydrant uh, aims at reintroducing the Roman Hadrian aqueduct into contemporary urban life of the city of Halandri. Hadrian's aqueduct is 23 kilometers long, um, connecting eight diverse municipalities. So we are going to also have the chance to talk about intermunicipal cooperation, something that was touched a bit yesterday. And uh, we can use this case, this example, in order to see how intermunicipal cooperation can also be very vital for uh, such a cultural heritage project. So it goes from the periphery to Athens city center. Interestingly, it exclusively supplied Athens with water for nearly 1,080 years, from 140 AD up to the 30s. Um, the monument is literally hidden in, uh, in the sense that it is underground, so it is uh, difficult to also uh, reactivate it and reintroduce it uh, in the contemporary urban life because uh, it is hidden, but it's also hidden in a metaphoric way since it is unknown and forgotten by the locals. The project goes beyond the sightseeing approach, which we are very used to, taking advantage of the action to raise awareness and promote behavioral change regarding the use of non-potable water, because it still has water, but uh, it's used for irrigation, non-potable purp uh, purposes. The sustainable maintenance of sufficient high-quality groundwater and the participatory management of relevant services, creating a water solidarity economy as a potential common space for non-potable water management beyond top-down governance. And this is exactly what I would like to discuss here today. This water solidarity economy approach cannot be separated from uh, ongoing public debates regarding water, 
and the commercialization and the privatization of water as a public versus private versus common good. In Greece, social movements related to water have been mobilizing people in several urban and rural areas for more than a decade. Uh, for those who might not know it, I remind you Thessaloniki, uh, where uh, some years ago the referendum ended up with the vast majority, up to 98% or something like that, voting against the, pri the privatization of water. In Stagiates, on uh, Pelion Mountain, a, a totally different context, people are fighting against the, commerciali the commercialization of water under the slogan, free water, attracting significant countrywide support. And in Halandri, in our case, the organization SOS SOS Rematia was founded in the 90s and it aims to preserve the Pendeli Halandri stream as a natural common water resource resisting any interventions. So, regarding the water solidarity economy now, um, the first step taken by the Athens Water Supply and Sewerage uh, Company, AVAP, was to release a needs assessment survey on non potable water in order to map citizens' interest to in joining uh, the Hadrian Water Network. Let me also pass the slides. They're not very well connected to what I'm uh, presenting, but you can have also here a view of how this aqueduct looks like in the surface and also underground. And also its line, this water line, um, beginning from Parnitha and ending up to uh, straight to the city center of Athens in Kolonaki, the Xamenei. So, uh, based on, on these survey results that uh, Aidap uh, released, um, about 60 in the beginning people, uh, now they are extended up to 100 beneficiaries, either individuals or organizations, expressed an interest in joining. AVAP designed a four kilometers long network of pipes that will enable most of these interested citizens to connect to the aqueduct and use the Hadrian water for irrigation purposes. For individuals or organizations who want to join but are far from the pipe network, two water tank trucks will serve their neighborhoods by distributing water across Halandri. The water solidarity economy in Halandri will be um, a tripartite body consisting of the municipality, a VAP, and a water, so, uh, a water community of local citizens, either individual users, organizations, associations, etc. A VAP will take an administrative role guaranteeing the quality and quantity of water and the construction, operation, maintenance, and expansion of the pipe network. The municipality of Halandri will function as the political guarantor and overall facilitator, covering water distribution costs and reservoir disposition for those being served by the water trucks. And users, uh, local people, I mean citizens, will form a local water watch, in a sense, promoting the wise use of water, raising awareness and collecting and monitoring data on water sampling and consumption. In a nutshell, the water community's tasks include protecting and preserving the resource, making suggestions for water networks expansion, managing the district distribution network through municipal water tank trucks, monitoring sustainable water management by increasing public reflection and debate on water management issues, for instance, requesting footprint reports and annual consumption reports to monitor relevant KPIs, making suggestions for introducing new users and members in the water solidarity economy community, etc. This is something that happens for the, uh, the first time in Greece, uh, having all the stakeholders around the same table uh, for the co-management of water um, in Halandri. 
Against this background, uh, the Hadrian non-potable water network will not be offered as a top-down municipal service, but is instead perceived as a network of people, neighborhoods, needs, and capacities paving uh, the way for a water uh, solidarity economy, as I said before. Uh, this connection to the network uh, and the water solidarity economy will not be limited to water use. Uh, it also includes, at the moment, other links to the Hadrian Aqueduct, for instance, an online local archive coordinated by Medina, the Mediterranean Institute for Nature and Anthropos, as part of the Cultural Hydrant Project, includes more than 350 items bearing witness to tangible and intangible past and contemporary local heritage capital, mostly related to water. Uh, the idea is that this local archive will be uh, constantly en enriched and also co-managed by people who are uh, at the moment involved in the local history, uh, oral history group. Um, also a local Hadrian festival uh, will be established as an annual event held during the city's broader annual cultural festival. Um, the educational community, and I mean students, have also uh, in a participatory way designed their schoolyards who wh are now part of the broader regeneration, regeneration plans. Uh, the, the, the participatory design of the schoolyards was coordinated by the cooperative common space and uh, the regeneration plans um, were done by uh, Thymios Papagiannis and are now at the moment uh, under construction, so we are going to have the opportunity also to see these quality green spaces to be realized. So, reflecting on uh, the participation, taking into account this specific project and reflecting on participation in urban and cultural development, we could agree that in all areas and scales of planning, participation is a key policy and socially innovative aspect of governance. However, on one hand, uh, civic participation calls for grassroots politics and increased, repre increased representation in planning, but on the other, um, it can be also criticized as a vision that is being embraced, embraced by agendas that aim uh, to disengage the central state from social policy, for instance. On one hand, it reduces social exclusion and enhances people's say um, in development. On the other, it's possible legitimizing effect on already taken um, decisions, the emergence of new social exclusions due to class, ethnicity, and so on, the glorification of individual uh, responsibility in the form of uh, active citizenship, and the risk, of course, of non-representation. The possibility, or better hope, that democratic, transparent processes can be achieved is also, at the same time, threatened by the consolidation of illegitimate, unrepresentative power relations. Bearing this in mind and against this background, Halandri has been attempting a paradigm shift by developing strong heritage branding in the periphery and proposing also a new model of co-managing natural and man-made resources while activating local cultural and social capital and endogenous development. While the big idea is to avoid the hierarchical relationship between the water company and customers, the water solidarity economy initiative is also a challenging experiment requiring all actors to explore their limitations and hopefully also transcend them. 
cooperatives, social and solidarity economy, and other community-led governance models, for instance, energy communities, can offer vital experience and ideas about collective management, countering the market-oriented vision that dominates the debate on how to solve urban problems sometimes. In other words, the water solidarity economy for the Hadrian Water in Halandri may prove much more than a project outcome. It may initiate a broader debate on the management of commons, on solidarity attitudes and practices, socio-ecological justice, participatory governance, community engagement, sharing, and also scholar instability in decision making. So I will close here and leave the rest for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Irini. Lucas Triandis will continue, and then we'll discuss. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, okay, louder. I was uh, beginning saying thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me now? A bit? Okay. Um, I will uh, contribute to, to today's discussion with. Um, uh, an experience of a similar discussion that took place uh, last year about Athens in uh, a place nearby, in a municipality venue nearby. And uh, this discussion is about the experience of the uh, Athens Urban Age Forum uh, in the context of the LSE Athens Urban Age Task Force that evolved for two years from 2020 to 2022. Uh, I think that uh, it will be maybe an interesting uh, parallel uh, path to discuss later on. So I will go quickly to share with you some of the slides. Uh, I will focus on issues of greening and public space, which are more relevant to uh, the topics of today's and yesterday's um, event. Uh, some brief the description of the project. This was a project uh, uh, undertaken by the uh, Urban Age, the program in the London School of Economics in collaboration with the uh, city of Athens. Uh, Urban Age is a, a program that uh, searches uh, data and does very interesting mappings about cities and does research on uh, cities on a global scale. Uh, for the last 20 years and uh, produces some interesting uh, comparative analysis and um, some interesting uh, publications. The cooperation with the city of Athens uh, uh, extended in a two years period and involves an uh, in-depth uh, spatial analysis of Athens, which is what I'm going to present today, the first part. And also event that uh, involved the public events, some thematic workshops, and uh, a forum in the tradition of the urban age forums that take place in different cities around the world in the last uh, years, and produced this interesting newspaper, which you can see the cover over there. And I have the link for those of you may be interested to uh, look it up a bit further. So uh, first, I will go in, I'm going to present some uh, uh, of the data that uh, are included in this uh, small publication about Athens. This is more analytical rather than uh, ideas on how to intervene in the city or policy making uh, instructions. But even uh, the way that the data is presented and the mappings are presented uh, gives already an idea of how to lead, let's say, policy making, or how to prioritize what can be done or could be done uh, in the city. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, a comparative analysis among cities around the world uh, based on some indexes. Um, and uh, of course, this has many discussions that can open up uh, of, of how methodologically how you pick up indexes and how data is uh, collected. Uh, but from this, 
quite complex uh, um, uh, table, I would like to mention maybe uh, three uh, indicators that are where the blue uh, circles uh, up in the uh, right. Uh, one of them has to do with the length of bicycle lanes, the second one has to do with CO2 emissions, and the third one uh, has to do with uh, greening. Uh, in all these indicators, Athens seems to be somehow lacking behind in comparison to other cities, not just the very uh, well-known cities that are often uh, described as uh, good examples of uh, uh, livability, but also from other cities that uh, maybe uh, are not so expected. And these are indicators that have to do with the environment, but also uh, social indicators and economic indicators. Uh, yesterday we talked a bit about density. Density is indeed a very important, uh, um, let's say, element in terms of uh, analyzing cities, but also in policy making. And these uh, mappings present uh, a quite uh, well-known, uh, let's say, finding that Athens is a dense city and that it uh, remains a very dense city, particularly so in the uh, uh, central areas. And here, uh, in the context of a comparative analysis, we can see similar patterns of density with Paris and uh, a much more dense pattern uh, compared to other cities like uh, London or Berlin or Vienna or Milan. Now I will focus in some more interesting uh, data that have to do with uh, green spaces and open spaces. Um, and this slide shows uh, the city of Athens with the seven communities that were presented before by the city of Athens. Uh, Already from the very first depiction of where the green spaces are located, we can see differences and uh, a not so balanced, let's say, uh, distribution of uh, open and uh, green spaces, uh, with many green spaces concentrated in the central areas or the eastern and uh, southern areas, while other areas on the northern parts of the city remain, uh, let's say, lacking uh, green and open spaces. And the two diagrams uh, below show again the differentiations in, um, among the neighborhoods of the city in terms of uh, total green area and amount of green spaces. So this already gives a hint maybe of prioritizing where to go next and what to do first. Uh, these mappings are in a similar logic. They show um, public spaces, squares, and their location within the city of Athens. Again, we see different patterns of centrality, different patterns of uh, distribution. We see neighborhoods that do not have any public space and others mainly in the central areas that uh, have lots of them. And on a different scale, which I find uh, um, a very good uh, uh, input in the, today's discussion, we can see the wider Athens area, the Athens Basin, and we can see the distribution of large-scale uh, parks and green areas in the Athens Basin, but also the surrounding mountains, which constitute uh, very important environmental entities, and also the seafront. Uh, the two uh, well, the first, uh, sorry, the first uh, polygon is the city of Athens, the boundaries of the city of Athens, and then the two other uh, circles are the five kilometers distance and the ten, 10 kilometers distance. This is a mapping that already says something very simple, that there are large scale open spaces or green spaces or environmental entities that are very close to the densely built areas. So this gives ideas of how to connect them maybe to create some networks on a metropolitan scale or a large scale intervention to create, to link the green entities and the sea. Uh, for those of you interested, I said that more data can be found in the uh, uh, newspaper that I present here on the left. And now on the remaining five minutes, I think I will uh, present some uh, 
uh, images from the Athens Urban Age Forum that took place exactly one year ago uh, here in Athens with some, let's say, good examples or good practices from uh, other cities in Europe. These are some uh, images from the forum. Ricky Bardet, the director of the program, lectures, the audience, and this culminated in a public event with the presence of the mayor of Athens. Uh, the forum was focusing in three topics. One of it was greening a public space, and the other two were sustainability in transportation and walkability, and livability and equity. Uh, I will uh, very shortly refer to the first theme, which is greening a public space, with the input uh, we had from different cities uh, of Europe and their greening and public space interventions. Some of them were uh, discussed yesterday. Paris was mentioned lots of times as an example of very uh, bold and very uh, ambitious uh, interventions for greening the a wider city, and this is uh, the greening of Saint-Élysée, but also the uh, creation of new public spaces. This is Place de la République, that used to be a place for cars, and nowadays a place for um, a public space. And also, uh, in the smaller scale, uh, interventions that are trying to create uh, in an innovative manner, uh, new public spaces and new green spaces uh, on the local level, on the neighborhood level, uh, on the terraces of the buildings, on the facades of the buildings, or even on uh, smaller scale uh, public squares. But even on the larger scale, uh, the scale of the transportation systems, very innovative uh, ideas of how to transform, for example, the uh, ring road of the city, into a much more greener area with uh, open spaces and uh, urban agriculture. Uh, the second city that I refer to is London, uh, and the reference here is more on the management and the, um, uh, let's say, the organizational aspects of greening the public spaces, and here there were some very interesting inputs from the Royal Parks of London, which is a charity that is uh, created uh, to manage the eight large-scale parks of uh, London that uh, we can see here, but also smaller uh, scale uh, green spaces uh, with the idea of somehow trying to balance funding uh, and also to add programming uh, in... Uh, parks in different ways. But also the uh, focus on good design. Uh, London has created a, an, um, an agenda, a policy uh, brief, which is called Good Growth by Design, and uh, focuses on how important is good design in delivering uh, green spaces and open space and public spaces on the small scale. Here we have some very interesting sketches that describe these very, very small-scale interventions in the city fabric. The last uh, and somehow well-known uh, uh, example that I want to bring to the discussion is comes from Milan and the creation of new uh, public spaces in basically on streets, on spaces that used to be taken by the private vehicles uh, with the tools of tactical urbanism. And an interesting point is that uh, Milan uh, focused very much on the neighborhood level, on the periphery. You can see that all the interventions, none of them is in the city center, and all of them are in the neighborhood level where people live. And also the focus on the quick implementation of the final stage. So these uh, three pictures show the uh, situation as was before, the very quick uh, pilot intervention with colors and paint, and then uh, also very quickly the final uh, implementation of the project. So to sum it up, some key takeaways. Uh, here I will refer to a couple of these. Uh, one um, interesting point maybe to keep for the discussion is this connection between a clear overall strategy, a vision, and then very specific uh, particular uh, projects and how this can work uh, together. Uh, the issue of uh, 
uh, trying to find innovation and cr be creative in dense cities. Athens is also a very dense city, so uh, innovation and creativity is uh, necessary. Uh, the different networks of smaller and larger scale uh, open spaces and the focus on the neighborhood level. The links between the ecological aspects of public spaces and the social aspects, which uh, somehow work together. And the focus on public consultation. And some more to uh, finish. Uh, the the um, connection between public space and mobility. Uh, the goal to reclaim space from private cars and turn it into green space and public space, issues of programming, management, and funding. funding. And uh, the last point, uh, the importance of good design in, uh, uh, in creating new public and green spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, your amazing inputs. I think they really inspired us and I have a lot of questions for each one of you. So by um, finishing with what you said, uh, Lucas, invest in good design, I would like to start from Tilemachos and his um, competitions. And I would like to, um, for you to elaborate a little bit more your experience. According to um, the difficulties, the discrepancies, the contradictions that a good idea, a good concept, has to pass in order to become reality, become a real project in Athens. According to your experiences, and how you mentioned um, on the fruitful observations of the administration. So we would like to listen to your uh, experience of how a good concept becomes reality. You showed us a very big scale competition with a lot of parts of Athens, but you started from uh, it's something like uh, a good video that you have prepared and doesn't play. Uh, you're expected to play, but it doesn't play. So I have to say that we have, uh, in a way, four uh, first prizes. Last. Uh, let's say, uh, approximately 15, 20 years, and none of them is uh, yet implemented. So, talking about difficulties, there are levels of discrepancies or difficulties. We could start from, let's say, the absolute uh, zero level of that. It was, I think, uh, it was, uh, the second, no, it was the second competition that we did, and it was about a, a town hall in Arkalochori in Crete. We got the first prize, it was the, first, uh, the second competition, and we started, it was about a municipality that is called Arkalochori. We st already started discussing with uh, the mayor, but uh, at the moment, there was this uh, whole discussion about Callicratis and the reforming of Callicratis. And even if we had started, uh, in a way, uh, putting this into track, the municipality got abolished. There was no uh, municipality, so there was no uh, uh, option for a town hall. Uh, and then, that was the first uh, wonderful case. Then, let's move to, let's say, Dera Petrona, which was a park, a first prize for a park in Piraeus, next to the ancient uh, gate of Aetionia. We started discussions with uh, the municipality, and there was no absolute point of contact with them. At the end, nothing has been implemented yet, apart from some excavations in the area. And what I know is that the, the technical uh, services of the municipality took the preliminary design as it was and in a way baptized it something like construction documents without 
performing any construction documents, and they proceeded with some kind of realization without our involvement. The third case is the municipality of Heraklion. And there, the game is quite complex, as I tried to, to explain, because we have, at the same time, the involvement of the municipality of Heraklion, the port authority of Heraklion, and the Ministry of Culture, with no uh, fruitful, uh, let's say, cooperation between the three. What is now happening is that the Ministry of Culture, which only that owns the monuments itself, the Arsenali, proceeds just to a restoration of the monument and not in a, a total regeneration of the area according to the competition. The fourth case is uh, the municipality of Athens, where it seems that we have a quite, eff a, a quite good uh, collaboration. Uh, it is I think quite clever from their part that even if this was a very ambitious uh, competition that involved many, many uh, sites, they chose to implement just a small part uh, about Ermu from uh, Captain Caria to Thysio, and this quite small part seems to proceed uh, smoothly towards implementation, even if it takes uh, possibly a lot more time than uh, Milan. Okay, so we're in a good um, mood. So Let's there are, say. I would say that it is one out of four, but this is still a good score. Yes. I am quite satisfied. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tulemachia. This is a very, I don't know, not very optimistic, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, but, uh, Irini, maybe it's just a, a, a short question to all of you first. I, mean, I think what you saw, on the other hand, is something which seems to proceed somehow, right, as a project. And looking at this kind of uh, project, as you call it, and how we can join the water and create really an intermunicipal um, concept of collaborating, as we also were talking about it yesterday as concepts, I wanted maybe to you, for you to elaborate a bit more on the process behind it and how maybe this project was initiated and by whom? So is it the state who initiated this project and thought about this uh, concept of the revitalization of the aqueduct? So maybe you can uh, elaborate a bit more on this so that we kind of get the concept behind it because it's also something very unusual for the Greek context in that case and very positive also. So uh, it was initially initiated by ADAP, actually, who um, has the ownership of the, the water part. And uh, the municipality um, is responsible for what happens on the surface, let's say. And there is also the effort uh, of Eastern Attica who uh, are responsible for the monument. So um, then they brought the partners around the same table and we started designing the proposal because uh, it went, it was a competitive process and um, we won the, 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 the project, the proposal. And uh, now, uh, af after the, the project um, kicked off, also a parallel discussion about uh, the um, scaling up kicked off. And uh, what I promised to, to comment on uh, in my presentation, but then suddenly I ran out of time and I left it for the discussion, was about uh, the idea of scaling up uh, to an intermunicipal project because the Hadrian Aqueduct is not only under Handralandri but under eight municipalities. So the region of Attica uh, initiated a discussion about an integrated territorial investment um, for this period, 21-27, and um, which would be the first 
intermunicipal and thematic also ITI dedicated to uh, the Hadrian Aqueduct. I'm not sure where the debates are at the moment. I uh, don't think they went too far, but uh, this is the next step uh, either for an ITI or for another project for the Hadrian Aqueduct scaling up and intermunicipal cooperation for its whole route. the municipalities respond to all this invitation, let's say, to cooperate with Positively, but then I, I... And what about funding? Just a short comment on funding. Maybe, I mean, you were, trying, you were saying about the integrated uh, territorial investments. So this is state money, right? European. European, yeah. okay. I would like also to ask you, what is the level of um, involvement of the people? I mean, do they, what is your experience that? Because I'm, I'm, I think we're not very used to that uh, processes in Athens and in Greece. So I think your um, example is a paradigm to maybe show us the way. Mm. And did uh, finally the input you got from the people um, really change the, the way the whole project was moving and the policies maybe around it and if the administration was influenced? by your input, so I think it's very valuable for you to explain to us. Mm. Well, the project faced two very important challenges. First one was COVID. So uh, when the project uh, got accepted, it was the end of uh, 2020, June 2020, which was in the core of the pandemic. So, um, we had to, uh, to run all participatory workshops and especially also with uh, children, with uh, pupils, the participatory workshops to uh, design uh, their schoolyards and other participatory um, processes via Zoom, via, yeah. So that was uh, very different and we have uh, reflected a lot about this process and who could join them and who were also excluded from them and so on. So the first challenge was that. Uh, the second challenge about the water solidarity economy is that it is, it hopes to be a bottom-up um, initiative, but it is not um, initiated bottom-up. It comes from top-down and it hopes to be uh, engaging and uh, engage uh, local people. So, um, this is why we uh, think about this water solidarity economy in a very broad sense beyond the water use. This is why I said it also includes the local archive, where we had a lot of participation because there is an established oral history group there that provided us with items, with articles, with photos, with um, many, many uh, things that are related to water, but it will also go beyond that and will uh, end up being um, and a local narrative about uh, the local cultural heritage of Halandri, and not only, also for um, things that refer to the present. Uh, the participatory processes with schools, which are also established communities and have a specific place, have a specific pool of people, and, um, and of course, teachers and uh, people from, uh, and also parents um, that supported the project went very well. The festival is something also that someone can join within the water solidarity economy. So we perceive it in a broader sense and bring many parameters around the same table. And also, of course, when the, um, the pipe network is finished, then we are going also to talk about an established water community from people that are going to connect to the network again. 
Thank you, Irini. Um, maybe I will continue a bit also with, uh, with Lucas Triandis and about this complex system of how do you involve all these people together. One of your uh, takeaways, Lucas, is um, the public consultation. You talk about public consultation. Do you have some examples maybe from other cities or a way, a concept of how can we work towards this direction to public consultation? Is it from uh, initiatives like the LSC or uh, through the universities or even how, how would you envision this kind of public consultation? And talking about vision also, maybe my second question to that is, what do you mean when you also say we need a vision? What is kind of the idea behind the vision? Okay, thank you. Um, about public consultation, uh, we, we all agree that public consultation is a very important, uh, uh, let's say, tool for uh, policy making, but also very important in democratic terms. Uh, I think that uh, the main uh, problem is that, uh, maybe a main problem is Greece, is that public consultation is still not institutionalized in a way. So there is not a very coherent system of how to do a public consultation and some very uh, strict, or I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say strict, but a very coherent, let's say, and very clear uh, directions of how to do public consultation. So most of it is actually ad hoc uh, processes. Um, and I think that uh, there is a gap there that we can uh, discuss on how to improve this. There are certain examples from different uh, cities around uh, Europe of how they can provide this more systematic uh, framework for public consultation. Um, I could mention just one example that comes into mind from the forum, that, and this is the example of Vienna. I know that many people will react and say, okay, Vienna is a different story, but nevertheless, they had a quite interesting system of consultation, which was, in fact, uh, uh, dividing the city in different, uh, let's say, districts, and then assigning uh, to let's say, a group of architects and uh, social workers and sociologists and other uh, scientists, the responsibility to act as intermediaries between the city authorities and the citizens. So this was a decentralized system of uh, decision making, which was working both ways, collecting um, uh, the input from local communities and from the citizens and transferring them to the city. And on the other hand, taking the projects that the city want to implement and explaining them, informing the citizens so that uh, they could involve them in a better way. This is one example just to show that we need something more systematic as a public consultation uh, um, uh, framework in order for this to be effective and uh, reach to, and, and be uh, uh, substantive, let's say, in terms of uh, uh, citizen involvement and engagement. The clear vision, uh, again, uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, uh, we do not nowadays believe that we can have a plan that will fix the whole city at once or in five years or in ten years. We, luckily we have gone beyond that in city planning uh, thinking. But uh, in order to implement smaller projects uh, or neighborhood projects, it's very good to have an overall uh, image of what the bigger picture would mean. For example, if you want to create a, a green spaces, it would be very good to have a more clear idea of a network of green spaces and then start to implement parts of it here and there so that this would very simply lead to a very simple outcome that this would get connected to each other. So does data on the neighborhoods of Athens on green spaces and public spaces that are lacking, that are missing. 
And at the same time, you, told, you talked to us about the metropolitan scale and you showed us diagrams of the big greens of Athens. How could you explain to us a little bit more a possible network of green infrastructure of Athens in between these scales, the bigger one and the smaller one of the neighborhoods. Should we start from the neighborhoods, for example, having in mind the big green infrastructural uh, program and uh, structural plan, and not exactly a vision, but a structural approach for the city? No? Yes? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, yes, this links to the comment before. Uh, I think an answer would be that uh, probably the city should go both ways, from the very local level to the larger uh, picture, and then from the metropolitan level to the uh, downwards. Um, I think the... Um, Maybe they, I presented a, a, one of the maps I, sh I showed before was with the uh, metropolitan Athens, or the Athens Basin, let's say, and the city of Athens uh, in the center, and then the mountains around it. And I think this goes, uh, let's say, opens up to issues of governance uh, and how to, um, how to design, let's say, the, uh, who does what and to which direction. Uh, we should keep in mind that, for example, in the case of Athens, the city of Athens, the municipality of Athens is maybe a very large uh, municipality in terms of population, but in terms of uh, surface, it's just a very small part of what the city of Athens is, which extends you know, in the 30 municipalities of the basin and the 60 municipalities of uh, Attica. But the city is somehow one and not really defined by administrative uh, borders. So this goes to issues of governance because if you want to connect, let's say, the mountains or connect the city to the sea uh, or connect the big metropolitan parks that exist in different uh, municipalities across Athens, then you need uh, someone to say how these uh, green entities will be linked would be connected. You need someone to design these, uh, uh, these connections. Um, and from that point, the municipalities could indeed contribute in their own means, in their own surface, to a direction that would have, a, uh, that would have an effect that would be uh, a benefit that would multiply uh, for the whole city, let's say. For that. Um, I think we have one question from the audience, but I would like shortly to ask for just a one comment, Tilemachos, um, and then we just have five minutes to continue with Georgine Theodore. It's always this when the conversation opens up. But I found in Lausanne very interesting what you said about the preliminary conversation, so to say, which is put in public debate, if I got it correctly, so that they can decide upon a project for the future or to just discuss and debate upon is it something for our city, yes or no. Do you think, I, I think this is something which is common practice in Switzerland, but here we don't really hear about it. But do you think that through maybe um, a second way through, you're also a university professor, so you're doing similar projects with your students. Do you think that we could maybe scale up this idea of, uh, instead of finishing in the class, to put them into public debate, future ideas which maybe are a bit naive, but maybe they also propose something which we never thought about, or maybe something which is so innovative that we can go on with that. Do you think that this could be a solution for our to follow such a similar direction, to put into public debate, how can we... Um... Can you hear me? Yes. First of all, it's a common practice in Switzerland for competitions that are of a greater scale to first have the competition DD and then move to project competitions. So you have a an ideas competition in order to, to first have a series of proposals, have the public debate, and 
upon that have a strategy in order to be able to organize deeply the uh, project uh, competition. This for Greece is not uh, the case at the moment. We usually organize uh, these competitions for other reasons and we name them afterwards if we realize them or not uh, project competitions. So this preparation stage is, I think, very, very uh, useful if it is at the same time done uh, with efficacy. I mean, uh, rather uh, quickly. <laughs> okay? So, uh, I hope that we can do that also. But going to your second question about how the schools of architecture could offer uh, into this uh, field. I have a certain experience with the kind of class that we, I, I, I supervise for public spaces, where I, I, we did an experiment three times for sites in uh, Piraeus, in uh, the, the coastal uh, area of Piraeus, of a length of uh, approximately two kilometers, or uh, the Champ de Mars in Pedion um, Tuarius in, in, in Athens, or also the uh, Aristotelus Avenue in Thessaloniki. And the experiment was that we had a huge project for the students that could not be realized but just one team of students. And we, we had, at the same time, eight double teams that were working on the same area. And each student team took a small part of this bigger entity. This, in a way, led to a project that was not just another studio where each team did its uh, composition but it led to a research proposal, a serious, I think, research proposal for three important sites of three cities. And this could actually indeed start a debate about this, uh, these parts because of the quantity of the students that were involved and because their force was united in order to be able to study something bigger than just a square that could be that would be the usual um, composition uh, subject of a studio so i believe yes uh, that this may happen uh, in schools schools could have as part of their studios really really deep and interesting research uh, studies of parts of our cities. No? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tilemache. Uh, we are really pressed for time, but I don't know if there is one question from up there. We, I need to... Uh, sorry? You can save it. Because I think Georgine Theodore waits uh, on her Zoom very uh, pressed. She's so there. She's already there, yes. Okay. Uh, so so just, just to close the, Sorry, the discussion, the thank you very much for whatever you, we have discussed. It was very interesting what you showed us. I understand that from what we have heard, we need a combination of top-down, bottom-up, of bigger scales that start from a small part, but they start a competition. The important is to start the implementation. Or a, a network in the bigger scale, but that would be implemented in the neighborhoods. Maybe this could be a way of thinking in order to start in, with such big topics that we need in the short term to see results. So maybe we could continue afterwards in this uh, line. And, uh, okay, I am seeing Mark has already a lot of uh, ideas. And uh, thank you very much. We will continue afterwards maybe with uh, more discussion in between yourselves also. You could ask one another. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,
Um, we will just now connect the Zoom to welcome, let's see. Talking. Hmm. Maybe I'll go like that. Okay, Georgine is already there. Hello, Gati Lathos. Hello, do you hear us, Georgine? Yes, I hear you. Ah, perfect. Okay, that's good. So we welcome Georgine. Uh, I will just leave you the stage immediately by saying a huge thank you for connecting with us from your office in New York. Georgine Theodore is an architect, urban designer, and professor at New Jersey University Institute of Technology. Excuse me. Uh, Technologies College of Architecture and Design, to say it properly, where she coordinates the Master of Urban Design program. Georgine is a founder and principal of the award-winning architecture, urban design and planning practice, Interboro Architects, with an impressive spectrum of innovative urban projects in the US and abroad, also some of them in Athens, which you will be coming to in two weeks, I think. Maybe you will tell us something more about it. I'll leave you the stage because we're already running short of time. Thank you very much for being with us. I think we can hear you and you can hear us. Okay, wonderful. Uh, you can hear me okay? Okay. So, um, thank you so much uh, for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Tassos, uh, for the introduction. And thank you to Mark also for his kind words at the beginning. And, um, of course, this, um, this session is titled From Planning to Implementation, and that's at the heart of what we do um, as urban designers. And uh, to engage this um, crucial issue, I think my uh, slides are a little bit off sync. To engage this crucial issue, I'd like to talk about the relationship between large scale, long range planning efforts and short term catalytic projects. Uh, this is what was just spoken about a few moments ago. Um, and talk about them in my projects, both in the United States um, and in Greece. And so I'm going to start with the short term catalytic projects. Um, when my partners and I started our practice in Jaburo back in the early 2000s in New York, um, our first sole projects were a series of temporary public spaces. Uh, land space, this was a temporary uh, sculpture park and tree farm in New York City. Um, rest uh, commonplace, um, our redesign of the U.S. Um, pavilion in Venice, uh, where we made the courtyard and the galleries accessible. All of the materials were used somewhere else after the project was over. Rest stop, this is a temporary tree grove um, and educational program for uh, high school kids. Um, in which we recycled and reused um, all of the materials in the project. And holding pattern at uh, MoMA PS1, which was also a temporary public space and also dealt with reuse. And here we asked um, PS1's neighbors if there was anything that they needed. And we designed and built some of those things that people asked for. And we held them in the courtyard. Each piece was tagged, making it visible. And then we gave um, our clients their stuff after the project was over. So the project um, became much larger than the installation itself, much larger than, a, say, a so-called tactical project because of its duration, its territory, and the number of clients. And so instead of just working for MoMA, we worked for about 100 different community organizations and individuals. And the installation was really the result um, of a conversation with these different uh, groups but it also, the installation became a setting for those conversations and a setting for those groups of people that don't normally interact. And um, many of our clients, they organized programs and performances um, in the courtyard over the summer. So through this project, we brought together people who are not typically part of the design and planning process. Um, and through this short term temporary project, we designed a larger and longer term process that went beyond the boundaries of the museum and brought new voices and programs into the institution. So I would say this is a, a, one of our goals here was to be inclusionary and participatory. And it was an important project for us um, 
and the way that we think about design with many actors. And after the holding pattern, we increasingly designed places and objects specifically for the purpose of fostering interaction and to use design interventions, not only as a kind of designed object, but really um, as a tool in the planning process. And um, as you know, many people are excluded um, from planning processes, not necessarily by design, but because the formats of planning, the, the legalities, um, they are, um, uh, they're, they're, they're inaccessible. And so what we do in the office um, is really design spaces and tools to facilitate such processes and to make them more accessible. Um, and over the following decade, um, we've scaled from these smaller conceptual projects to larger scale urban and infrastructure projects um, that really stay true to the conceptual ambition uh, and the ethics of our earlier work. And this shift in scale started with Rebuild by Design um, and our project Living with the Bay. And here we assembled a multidisciplinary team of designers, engineers, educators, um, and and our approach combined large scale systems analysis and close on the ground engagement with local conditions. And the project bundled uh, flood mitigation strategies with regional open space strategies that improve the ecology of the waterways and the accessibility of the public spaces along them. So there was this um, long term large scale regional strategy, but we jump started that plan with shorter term priority projects, such as this public space which uh, doubled as a flood retention zone. And our work reflected um, an emerging attitude towards um, flood protection. And I think, you know, working uh, uh, like in sustainable urbanism more generally that, which is, it's not purely a technical problem, but really a more complex ecological, economic um, and social uh, challenge. And so um, designing multidisciplinary collaboration among architects, planners, scientists, the humanities, it's really crucial to answering these difficult questions that relate to climate change. And so our project was more than just the physical design proposal. We really organized a process of interdisciplinary collaboration, um, a process in which we could recognize each other's expertise and learn how to combine talent to tackle the challenge. So I would emphasize here the need for discipline, interdisciplinarity. Um, uh, we've been working in Detroit since 2016, where we now have an office, and we've worked almost exclusively for the city, and we've led a number of neighborhood plans. And our first um, was the uh, Campo Davis and Bangletown plan. Um, and again, uh, we designed a longer term strategic plan that organized around three major planning elements, housing and economic development, open spaces and community nodes, streetscapes and connectivity. But we also developed a series of shorter term catalytic projects that could be completed um, almost immediately. And so our process as designers, we really went back and forth um, between developing the larger scale framework and identifying what were the projects that could be done in the immediate future. So it really um, requires an interscalar approach, uh, each scale in informing the other. And in order to strategize about what could be implemented, we talked to a lot of people um, and we convened many conversations with different groups. Uh, we, had, we had many community meetings, uh, focus groups, but also smaller meetings, uh, such as a women's meeting, model building, game sessions, and different settings like um, this ice cream truck that doubled as a neighborhood map. Um, it was a kind of engagement station and uh, it was a conversation starter. And we had kind of ice cream in exchange for information. So uh, the plan, one of the plans priority projects, uh, uh, well, actually um, several of the um, planning, uh, the priority projects are now being implemented. But one of the priority projects was rehabilitating a vacant school. Um, and here we applied some of our temporary and our tactical approaches. The city really liked it and they even started re uh, uh, referring to our approach as tactical preservation. And building on this experience, we then went to work on uh, with the city uh, to, uh, to create their vacant schools disposition strategy. And this was a project in which we creatively assessed and envisioned futures for nearly 70 decommissioned schools. And uh, there was broad consensus that the city should develop a strategy to deal with the vacant properties, 
but there wasn't a clear process. And I believe that we won this project because we were able to visualize and design a process to get the work done. And, and I think we succeeded because we were able to tackle the challenge um, at these different scales, from the scale of the individual room to the school building, to the school yard, uh, to the neighborhood um, and to the city and region. And, and we synthesized our evaluations um, of not only the building, which you can see um, in the teal, but also the economics, like what are were the spatial potentials of the market? You can see that in purple and the needs of the neighborhood in uh, red and the historical significance. And this was to help the city prioritize redevelopment and also to think about what would be a sensible path towards implementation. Um, uh, so one thing that I'm particularly proud of with this project, um, and I think it talks to some of the things that we heard already today, is the way in which we applied our engagement skills, which we had really honed over the years in public engagement processes, you know, intercept surveys and, you know, working with people out on the street. Here we used our engagement process, not in public, but to bring together different departments and agencies who had a stake or interest in the project, but they weren't meeting or talking on it. And so establishing communication and creating a space of discussion and collaboration in a, in a very large and hyper-siloed hyper organization, such as a city or regional government, uh, was really central to our success. So we've also done a lot of work um, with different uh, departments and agencies in New York, especially in New York City, and over the past four years, we worked uh, closely with New York City's Department of Health to imagine and implement public spaces that mitigate heat and noise um, in neighborhoods, um, particularly in the South Bronx, that you see on the screen here. These are um, communities that are unjustly burdened with the highest intensities of environmental stressors. Here you see a map of heat vulnerability um, and the South Bronx is really the most vulnerable. You can see Central Park um, in the lower left where there's actually no heat vulnerability. So I helped um, the Department of Health reconceptualize their placemaking program so that instead of doing one-off um, tactical art installations, we strategized and created temporary public space projects that jumpstart longer term capital projects that are in the pipeline. And so with each of these um, early phase projects, we tested out some aspect so that we could make a longer term project more robust or more inclusive. And so like refreshing waters, this was our temporary cooling station, which used simple tactical moves uh, like painting an existing ledge to transform it into a public bench. Uh, the project also included a misting line and fans that brought uh, cool air to um, a popular neighborhood gathering space. Um, here you can see it in section. And we received support and we collaborated with many different departments and agencies, the Department for Aging, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Parks, um, and, and so on. And Watergate, this was our follow-up um, where we improved aspects of our previous cooling station technically. Uh, we improved the misting, but we also uh, changed the ways that we measured and demonstrated our project's performance, um, as shown here with the, our use of infrared photography to measure the installation's impact on temperature at the microclimate scale. Um, so here what you can see is that we had this kind of iterative process. We did a pilot one year, then we did it a second year, and we really built on these uh, longstanding uh, partnerships. And since August, I've been leading um, our work on two projects along the Erie Canal. Uh, here, our client is the New York State Canals Corporation, uh, who own the canal itself, um, and then um, the New York Power Authority, who actually have hydropower facilities along the canal, and they generate power from it. So it's a very big and complicated project. You can see, I don't know if people are familiar with the geography of New York State, um, but uh, the project is on, the canal system is almost over 500 miles long, and it represents one of the city's most important infrastructures. It, it, the canal essentially connects the Great Lakes, which you see on the left, um, to New York City, which you see on the bottom uh, right. And the canal was built um, uh, to move goods by barge. Um, and today, all of the infrastructure that was built nearly 250 years ago, the canal, the towpath, the locks, the guard gates, they remain, but it's no longer used um, to move goods. It's no longer a commercial waterway. 
The canal is used recreationally for boating and it's used to generate hydropower and keeping it open really requires a kind of complicated regime of care. Um, and also the, the concrete structure of the canal um, needs to be uh, regularly repaired. And so the, um, the infrastructure remains um, and uh, it requires huge investments to keep it open and running, but the use has completely changed. So there's really an open question about how to reimagine this colossal historic uh, infrastructure that's basically lost its key purpose. Um, and so our work has been to reimagine this infrastructure and we've been con uh, commissioned to conceptualize, design and build a series of public spaces um, along the canal. And our work basically combines critical repairs to the canal infrastructure with um, public space projects that will enhance uh, everyday life for residents, but also boost local economic development. So you can see some of, um, of the structure and uh, here we're developing a series of thresholds that set up views and also enhance the experience. We're also uh, working with an art consultant and we've developed a proposal for an art triennale um, in Western New York. And so the main site will be an art park. And here um, we have a, a concept of uh, landscape rooms. And so we're really designing for everyday routines of residents, but then also big events that will bring thousands of visitors to town. So it's a kind of dream project at the intersection of infrastructure, architecture, landscape, and art. And so uh, the Erie Canal work is, I would say, eerily connected to another initiative I've been working on since 2018. Um, that's the reimagining of Hadrian's Aqueduct in Athens, Greece. Um, of course, many people and organizations have been working on this uh, for years. We already heard um, uh, about uh, Irina's work and others. We're going to hear more, I think, later today. Um, and so my work um, on Hadrian's Aqueduct began with an academic urban design studio I led at NGIT that was focused on Likabetos. Um, and I did that in collaboration with the city of Athens and rebuild by design. And I worked very closely um, with the former deputy uh, mayor of urban Greenland, Yomi Arvili. And this was back in 2018 when the city was planning to make um, key upgrades to the hill. And my students um, and I developed open space frameworks that were based on specific uh, stakeholder groups. And we followed up um, with uh, engagement work where we um, uh, solicited input about what was the kind of mix um, of, um, of you know, passive and active recreation that people wanted. Um, but um, in that studio, we spent a lot of time understanding how water is managed on the site. And we learned that the water runs off of the hill directly into the stormwater system. Um, and it's also close to where the waters of um, Hadrian's Aqueduct um, are dumped into the storm drain. Um, this particular project, um, one of three, it strategized how water could be retained on the hill by bundling stormwater management, uh, erosion control, and public space improvements. Um, and we already, uh, um, Irina already gave a really great description of the aqueduct. Um, so, um, but we know that it still collects water um, um, because of the ingenuity of Roman engineering, but the water is thrown away. Um, and uh, as was already explained, there are plans underway to pump this water to the surface and use it. But um, those future users, they don't currently really see the aqueduct and they don't typically understand how it works. And so after my Lika Betos studio, I started collaborating with ADAP um, and the Civil Engineering Department at NTU um, in Athens to visualize the aqueduct um, and the potential of priority sites. Um, ADAP had a very rich and detailed database that you can uh, see uh, here um, that's in a map, a uh, Google map that had, is very valuable, but it's really hard to understand at a glance. And so we did um, several independent studies and seminars on the aqueduct, and we began by just trying to visualize the entire aqueduct so people could see it as the resource that it is. Um, and we also started to highlight the existing key conditions in a very um, filtered way uh, uh, to see um, what, um, like say the tree cover or the density of buildings. And these are at specific priority sites that ADAP was already looking at. And we got a grant from NGIT to develop a toolkit. 
And last year, my students and I, um, again, working very closely with ADAP, we created this illustrative section, which um, explains the aqueduct in relationship to the built environment above it. And it makes visible some key issues, but we also discovered some interesting things in making it as well. So you can see at the top on um, the slope of the tunnel in relationship to the topography, the number and the frequency of wells, the different um, municipalities that share the water, um, but also some new things that like, for example, where the blockages are, which you see in the hot pink, and they show these kinds of basins where Munis those basins don't align with the municip municipal lines. So if people are going to share the water, they're going to have to collaborate. So it's really a way to kind of jumpstart conversations about um, municipal intermunicipal collaboration. Um, it also showed um, uh, some of the varying uh, land use conditions and the section of the tunnel itself below. We created diagrams that explain how the system works and also what are some of the key threats, particularly related to groundwater recharge. And in my most recent studio this past spring, I built on this work and I tested uh, the hypothetical vision of using the aqueduct's water uh, to grow and distribute a million trees. So like, you know, I'm um, thinking about uh, the network of open space, um, how to address the heat island effect, um, but then also how to valorize the cultural heritage of the aqueduct and to kind of make it visible above ground. And so working in GIS and in collaboration um, with the Regional Plan Association with um, Ellis Calvin, we brought together data related to the region, uh, such as, um, you know, the, uh, the topography, the aqueduct, the municipal boundaries, uh, the building footprints, uh, uh, six priority sites that we were looking at, um, and we created um, a large scale framework for the whole aqueduct, but then with a focus on these six um, priority sites. Um, and similar to what was explained before, we had you know two or three students working on each site and then working in dialogue together to make the larger framework. Uh, we have an urban proposal worked um, on uh, refining the urban trail that some people are already thinking about and then about um, adding landmarks um, along uh, the urban trail. We also built um, a 3D digital model, which we've printed. Um, here you can see it, the aqueduct is etched in the middle. You can also see the Kikuchuk River um, on the upper right. Um, and we also did um, digital models of the priority sites. Um, this is um, the group that worked on Bethsemane, and then each group had a set of priority proposals for those, uh, for those sites. So um, uh, in summary, I, I wanted to go back um, to those key points that I've um, stated um, at the, um, throughout the presentation, um, uh, really in order to um, think about the relationship between planning and implementation, and particularly in my work, thinking about the short-term, the relationship between short-term projects and uh, the long-range vision, I'll leave you with um, these um, five kind of um, uh, principles uh, to uh, that are th underpinned in the work, being inclusionary and participatory, working inter in an interdisciplinary way, working between the scales, um, interconnecting municipal departments and agencies, and always having a kind of iterative process and building on longstanding partnerships. Um, I, Oops, I don't see where my last, my last slide is not here. It was, I know I'm also out of time. Um, my last slide, which is not there, but it was to um, invite you all. I will be in Greece um, and actually a little bit over a week. And on July 3rd, uh, I will be giving a full um, hour long lecture um, at uh, the Romanza space. Um, uh, I'm going to be leading the Doma summer school and I invite everybody uh, to uh, stop by and say hello, and I hope you'll come for the larger lecture. Um, but yeah, that concludes my presentation. I'm sorry if I, um, I think I'm okay on time. Yeah, thanks, Georgine. Um, we're now meeting for the third time, and I'm listening to 
to your presentation for the third time, and I have to say that I'm always very amazed by the numerous ideas you're bringing up, and indeed I'm making my notes, and I, I couldn't write that fast so that I got all these ideas, but uh, since we're discussing now for two years old, what could be uh, done, what could be happened, um, in, uh, what could be um, um, projected for essence, I want to link to some questions we already discussed um, um, the last days, if, if you allow me. But I want to pick up some lines. And one thing which was discussed in the, in the morning by, um, by Tila Machos was that there obviously is a long gap to bridge between a competition decision and then making really a permanent project. And you came up with these ideas of these kind of moving trees, right? So you're using the trees for a temporary installation and then um, um, planting them permanently somewhere. So this, could that be a kind of solution of saying, well, there are some elements which are implemented right after a competition so that you set a certain pressure also on the, on the, on the um, for example, the municipality or the clients to really go on with these things? Do you have some experience there? Yeah, 100%. And, um, uh, I guess I, at the risk of, at the risk of, um, you know, going too much on the surface and too fast. I mean, another opportunity would have been to dig really into one project in 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 greater depth. But and that's precisely what uh, I have been, you know, what I and my partners have been doing, which is that we've been working on these um, longer range projects and. Uh, seeking to do temporary projects that uh, jumpstart the longer range project. And so, yes, we have done that. Like, for example, um, one of the projects that I showed at the beginning, uh, Rest Stop, we had those temporary trees um, out, and I didn't get a chance to go into it in depth. But basically, there's a long range project to make a park along the East River, um, and it takes many, many years. And so, we brought those temporary trees. Um, out to the site where the park will be because people who live next to it wanted to experience it now. Um, and you learn something by doing that. And so I think, you know, to the points that were made in the previous session, which I think just were so much aligned with the things that I think I was talking about today, is that it's not that you're going always from the top down, the large strategic plan, and then to the priority projects. But by doing um, a kind of a temporary project, you can actually test out and see if um, some of the longer range projects or the longer range vision, um, maybe you'll learn something that will inform it and make it, you know, bring in the perspectives of people's specific needs or their ideas and, um, and really make the project build a bigger public of people who are interested in it, um, but then also enrich it because people who use spaces all the time have the best ideas about how to make them better. And so that's what we're we're trying to do. And so with these um, tree rooms, yeah, that was the kind of the basis of the studio. And so I didn't, I'm um, working on the publication now, but with the, um, the studio I did last semester, which was, we tested the hypothesis, could you plant and grow um, a million trees, just irrigating them by the wa existing water of the aqueduct? Um, and you know the idea would be to make some kind of immediate and visible presence of greening on top of the aqueduct, so that people now um, can see that that's uh, even though it's going to take years and years, and it's going to take a long time for it to work through that Attica government. But maybe in the short term, people can test those ideas out now um, and make use of the space today and get pleasure from it, but then also inform. Um, inform that longer range process. Like, you know, in the case of um, all the great work that's been done in Halandri, you know, how do you know that the pipes, where they're going, are they exactly where people want them or how people want to use the water? And those were some of the questions that I was trying to get at um, in my collaborations, you know, with people in Athens, but also in the work that I did with the students. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I think this is what, what a very, was a very good statement, and um, I thought that I would ask you about the million trees, but um, because this is a very ambitious project, but it somehow combines, and this is, uh, comes from your answer, or this I take from your answer, is that you're saying, well, there has to be this 
um, uh, these ambitious goals. Uh, however, this drives something which is, takes very long, so it's good that it's visible right in the beginning. And this is where, for example, the idea of the moving trees come from in a much older project. And I think for Athens, it could be really nice to consider this combination of temporal elements and, and maybe a long-term plan, because these temporal elements, I think, could uh, keep these processes also alive, even if there are some elections in between. Um, but I have another thing which was very interesting for me, which is the ice cream truck. Because we made exactly the same experience in German project there, it's not the ice cream truck, but the glue wine truck, which is hot red wine in the Christmas market. And if you address the people with this, um, you make on one hand the d debate on the city a kind of collateral product, but however, it's much easier to address these people. So could these uh, elements which on the first side, do not have really something to do with um, a, a heavy debate on urban redevelopment, but have more a kind of ludic approach, a more playful approach. In what way can these elements be productive in these kind of cumbersome pro, uh, um, processes of participation and public debate and public consultation? Share your experiences, please. Yeah, so the, the ice cream truck, um, that's a, that was a, you know, we've been making these, um, what we call spaces of engagement. And if you look on our website, we've done them in different, we've done like a lot of mobile tables that we've like uh, set up and, you know, bring people together. Um, and they're really um, have, um, they came out of our experience, um, you know, starting at the very beginning of our practice that, um, you know, these public projects and our clients are almost entirely, um, you know, governments, you know, public entities. There's a very, um, there's a very uh, already kind of set in stone uh, process in which the engagement occurs. You make the public meeting and you invite these different people. And what we found in a lot of our work, the same people always come to the to the meetings, and that's great that there are people who are interested, but there are a lot of people who actually don't have the time to go to the public meeting. And so we started to make these, um, so it's not about um, in a lot of cases going to a place where already people are going, but coming up, it looks playful, but it's actually very strategic. Um, in Detroit, um, for example, you can't just like, there's no like main square. There's no, um, there's, there's no like main place where everybody goes. The city is like completely spread out and everything is car based. So one thing we found was that if you have an ice cream truck that goes down the street and it plays the jingle, people come out because they want to get ice cream. And so it was a way to create actually a temporary public space in an automobile oriented and very dispersed site. Um, and also for us to get more connected to children, these are like people who um, aren't always going to the um, to those um, those public uh, meetings, and the younger generation are the ones who have the most at stake in these longer range projects. So it was really a way to do that. Um, and so we've continued um, to do that um, to do that kind of work, and always to have a multi pronged approach with engagement, not only using the kind of the regular channels and the regular formats. Of the um, of the public meeting, but then also really meeting people where they are, um, and yeah, trying to do it in a way that um, that's fun and brings beauty, even temporarily, but most importantly, brings new voices um, into a process. And I think I threw a couple of images up there. We did do also something very similar for um, Lika Betos, where we um, we actually had a mobile engagement station, which. We had like a Dexemini, but then also a different subway stations and elsewhere. And we were able to solicit a lot of input um, in that process through that, uh, through what was a game and a model. There are many ideas, but I think that you will have much more time in your presentation in um, Romanzo the next weeks. And so if you give us the dates, we can distribute it to everybody who registered to this uh, um, um, conference too, so that they can join in this discussion. And maybe if you have a kind of online solution too, I will join you there online. Um, it would be much better to have you here in Athens, but I'm, I'm glad that, you're, uh, that we could make it uh, at least in, in an online solution. But I have a last question, which, which I consider to be very important um, for the Athens case too. You showed the schools program about abandoned schools building, and even if the buildings are not um, um, abandoned here maybe, there are these problems in urban transformation where you have a typical situation kind repeated a hundred or a thousand times. So you have 
some hundred schools, maybe some thousand schools in the, in, in the um, Athens metropolitan areas. And so the, the questions repeat. And I think if we want to make urban transformation happen, we have to prepare it for not only making singular projects, but really thinking in series and scaling up and transferring to other solutions. And I was quite amazed by a chart you showed about this project, that on one hand, you consider them to be a standard case, but on the other hand, you consider very much the specificity of the context, right? So you're looking in what context, what could be this building? Um, and I think this is a very, very fruitful approach to combine a thinking of series with a thinking of specificity. Tell us about the magic ingredients. How do you do it? Oh, that's such a, that's a tough, that's yeah, a tough question the because question. Um, so the, toughest the, the school's project, I think what is quite interesting about it um, is that, well, there's so many things that are interesting about it, but like you said, um, it's in a way, um, there are some aspects of it that are replicable. And I think, um, and, and even that work on now that we're doing, it's, of the work that we're currently doing, say, for example, um, considering uh, different forms of enhanced maintenance, like uh, can you reforest or kind of create, use those sites for um, other ecological purposes in the future. Um, I think what you do on one site, um, you can actually apply and think about another. So there is absolutely baked, as you pointed out, baked into that project, um, this um, I guess the opportunity of um, of replication, but I think um, I think that one of the things that I would caution about is that I think everyone and I think we heard this in the previous session. You know, municipalities they just want to take an idea. Like a lot of um, organizations, they think they can just take an idea and do it. And there is always the kind of importance of looking, uh, having good ideas, but also really looking closely closely um, at the existing conditions and to see how to apply a replicable project in a way that um, builds on what you learned before, but doesn't um, just apply a kind of ready-made solution because we have to always look at the specific conditions. So I think, you know, originally when I was uh, imagining how to structure this talk, I was thinking it could always be about these dualities, like the the top down and the bottom up, the short term and the long term, and the replicable versus you know what is specific and unique. And I think that that for me is really the joy of design um, because it's really I think um, in a way being a good designer is really like being and this is going to sound really dumb but like really being good at matchmaking and coordinating and seeing how by putting those things together, you get a spark and create something new. And um, so I think it's not one thing or the other, but it's both. And it's you know through design that one actually negotiates between the replicable and the specific. And that gives you um, what I would say is a productive um, and exciting project. Mm. Yeah, so what I hear from your answer is that you're saying, well, there are these specific spaces which need a specific solution, but indeed we still have to think about how we make these thousands of, pro uh, of uh, projects happening by combining the specificity and also, let's say, a kind of serial approach or a repetitive approach. Maybe this is a project for the universities too, really to think, okay, are there some solutions which are uh, which can be applied in different cases because I think um, transformation has to happen fast. Um, and so I'm not sure whether we have the time to make a thousand new approaches and always starting with in, inventing, inventing um, uh, the very basic things. But this could be also kind of joint approach by the universities. Maybe you join in with uh, New Jersey Institute of Architecture in developing this kind of guidelines for implementing it. And so, yeah. May I, say, may I say something? I think um, one of the things that I've been wondering about, um, and um, are you still there, Mark? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't see you anymore. Is really that um, that it takes time, and I think one of the things that I've been discussing with other people and in institutions, particularly in the United States, is uh, you you can't solve everything in one semester, and I think that that's why I was so excited to be here today. 
because um, not only am I kind of going over uh, a site and some and issues multiple semesters, but when other people, other institutions are working on the same projects, I think we can actually get so much farther more quickly. And so I think that kind of that iteration and multiplicity is really um, what is so important. And I'm just so happy to have been part of this conversation and to hear what other people are doing because I hope we can work together um, in the future to advance these important ideas um, as we move forward. Yeah, great to hear that because I think we all share this view that we have to join forces to overcome the, the challenges. Georgine, it was really great to have you here. So thanks for contributing from New York. I think here it's already evening. Uh, I think you're right in the middle of the day. So thank you for making it. I wish you a great conference in Athens and a, and a conclusion. And maybe some of the colleagues which are sitting here in the audience also will join you there at Romanzo. So let us know about uh, the venue. I hope to seeing you soon in presence. And then we can go on with this uh, discussion. Thanks a lot, and I uh, ask for a big applause for Georgine Theodore. Great, thanks. Bye-bye. Ciao. Yeah, so thank you. I hope that you also got a lot of ideas. I really, I really consumed a lot of paper, even if this is not very sustainable, but maybe this is good for final discussion. Now we're doing a short break of how many minutes, Tessus? My yeah, let's do 10, 15 max, and then we're going on with session four. See you soon.
Πάρε ένα από εκεί. Κάτω, δίπλα στην τσάντα μου. Πάρε, πάρε. Α. <coughs> We will be continuing now. We are continuing now with the fourth session, so please take your seats, come inside. Peraste, peraste, peraste. Come in, come in. You don't hear us so well outside, come in. So in this concluding session, well, uh, we're running out of time a bit, as it is usually the case, but um, we'll try to stay in frame so that we don't tire you a lot. In this concluding session, we want to explore in which ways the administration and its various sectors can promote sustainable urban regeneration. Also, which are the productive models of governance and explore potential ways for synergies between the local authorities and different sets, sets of stakeholders and experts. We're also seeking to explore the purpose of planning long-term and big strategies and how to implement them in more stages and smaller projects. For this purpose, as a moderator, uh, we have invited Giorgos Vlialios, who is a journalist of the Kathimerini newspapers. He also holds a master's degree in urban planning from the NTUA. Giorgos is covering as a journalist urban and building issues that are transforming the urban landscape of Athens and Greece in general. And uh, he was also covering uh, for a long period of time the um, conversations of the regulatory master plan for, uh, for Athens. So I think his, his input here today will be very valuable to us. And the speakers we have invited, Michalis Woudis, who will talk about us about um, it's time to rethink governance. You say Michalis from bottom to the top. Michalis Woudis is the director of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung office in Thessaloniki, Greece. And prior to this, he was the head communication of Housing Europe, the European Federation of Public Cooperative and Social Housing in Brussels. A journalist in background, his persistent interest in cities gave a twist to his professional and educational path with a master's degrees in human geography and spatial planning. Welcome, Michalis. Second, next to Michalis, we have Dimitris Poulios. Dimitris will talk about, he will talk about the rethinking of governance and planning cultures in Athens. Dimitris is an urban designer, urban planner based in Athens and holds a PhD in urban planning and governance from the NTUA. He's also an adjunct lecturer in the University of Thessaly in the Department of Architecture. And his work focuses on the Athenian urban planning process and governance in the post-Olympics era. And third, we have Katja Stroheka from Munich. Thank you for being here with us today. Katja Stroheka is an architect from the background with a focus on uh, urban studies, and she is the head of urban planning of the inner city district of the city of Munich, and she is also the deputy head of urban planning in the Department of Urban Planning and Building Regulations. Thank you very much for being here with us today and discussing with us the Step 2040 that um, it was very much discussed also yesterday. I, I won't take much of time anymore. We just can start. Michali, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Tasso. And uh, I know it's not very convenient to be the only thing behind people's uh, Friday night drinks. And uh, so this is why I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. Anyway, I'm uh, sort of the odd one out in this project and in this conference. Uh, as you heard, my background is not in architecture, and this is also why you're not going to be seeing any beautiful slides uh, from my side. But both at personal level, but also as a foundation, um, we really find this project particularly interesting, timely, and obviously politically crucial. And 
the way in which we're dealing with uh, space is a highly political action um, with direct tangible effects, both to the national, natural environment and to the human factor. And uh, the space, in a way, is shaping behaviors and we are shaping space. And um, for us, since, uh, ever since we started working in Greece back in 2012, so 11 years ago, uh, one of our core messages has been the need for a socio-ecological transformation in Greece. And I think that the, the issues that we've been discussing since yesterday, uh, and actually since the beginning, the kickoff of this project back in 2021, are definitely prerequisites for such, for such a socio-ecological transformation in the urban environment. From my view, I will uh, only focus on two aspects uh, of governance that urgently need to be addressed in Greece, not just in Athens, aiming to also relate to some of the things that uh, we've been discussing and that have been mentioned uh, also yesterday. The first one is the lack of coordination uh, between the different levels that de facto interact uh, to, when it comes to shaping the urban space. And the whole journey starts from the EU level uh, that has the funding, that has in the latest years even more direct uh, agenda points or indirect agenda points uh, starting in 2015 with the urban agenda for the EU, the Leipzig Charter that has been updated lately, but also a number of policies that indirectly uh, affect numerous aspects of city life. The national government with a budget in Greece, we all know how centralized uh, things are uh, in our country, the regions, the intermediaries, let's say, between the EU and the national governments, the municipalities that are confronted uh, in many cases with limited competences, uh, usually implementing the projects and confronted with the emerging uh, issues and the closest link to the citizens. And of course, the, the final step is the coordination between the municipalities and wider and urban areas. And this is my main point of focus. But the second aspect is the citizen participation. We've talked a lot already about that and I'm sure we'll be hearing more uh, about this uh, in the coming presentations. But uh, my point of view is indeed that the key decisions are, making, are taken for uh, the citizens without the citizens. And this is why we also tend to present, we had excellent examples also today, the participatory examples as success stories. And this, in a way, has to end. I mean, this should be the rule and not the exception. Focusing on the first point, uh, coordination of decision makers. Essentially, cities are and will be confronted also in the long-term future with one main challenge, and this is dealing with the uh, multifaceted impact of the climate crisis. And in order to play a role in mitigating the climate crisis, indeed, cities have to redefine the way in which they deal with a number of issues up to 100%, moving from a, a linear to a circular economy and including the energy performance of the building stock, uh, mobility, management of natural resources, planning, maintenance of public and particularly green spaces. And in the end of the day, they have to become resilient, uh, both against chronic stresses, air pollution, uh, traffic jams, and so on, and against acute shocks, floods, fires, and so on. is a skill that cities, and especially cities in Greece, bigger and smaller ones, still need uh, to develop and keep developing. In Greece, I think there is no realization uh, how crucial the role of cities and their administration is towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals or the uh, EU Climate Goals. Um, we have not been able to make the link between these wider global and European agendas uh, to make them tangible both for the citizens but also the, the city staff, the people who are actually implementing projects. Despite the fact that uh, Athens is the only urban metropolis of this scale and in Greece, uh, it does not operate as one. Uh, yesterday, for example, Tassos asked uh, uh, about the collaboration between municipalities, and if I'm not mistaken, the response from Elisabeth was that around 95% of the projects the municipality of Athens is implementing uh, are limited in its territory only, in its boundaries. So the debate around the need for a metropolitan administration is not a new one, of course. It dates back to the 80s uh, in Greece, uh, while it has been also a relevant study uh, by the, the Institute uh, the, for Local Administration of the Central Union of Municipalities, of KEDE, back in 2017. But having, in the end, no metropolitan way of working, uh, Athens is failing to operate as a functional, um, as a, a functional urban region. So it cannot operate as one. And um, to build also a new narrative, or a new vision, as Evie, for example, uh, mentioned uh, uh, yesterday. 
um, and to implement also the concrete strategies that in the end can help it tackle uh, this challenge. And any attempt is hitting against this troublesome mix of competences. Ministries that actually in the end of the day are the ones taking very key decisions because they are also responsible for key issues such as, for example, land ownership. And we have the example of Elinicon, for example, in, in the case of Athens. And at the same time, informal initiatives uh, emerge to address the need for more collaboration among municipalities, as for example the Alliance of Southern Attica municipalities, but these are ad hoc and usually project-based uh, partnerships. The reality uh, is the same also in an urban context I'm more familiar with, the one of Thessaloniki, also another metropolis, a smaller one, but uh, another metropolis that is not governed as one. Um, in Thessaloniki, for example, there's the body of uh, the Metropolitan Developmental Agency, uh, MATH, that incorporates 11 of the 13 metropolitan municipalities of Thessaloniki, and they help build the overall capacity of municipalities, but in the end, the knowledge they generate, also through the participation of EU projects, is, uh, remains unused because the projects are, are not taking off, and we have been part of one of these initiatives, a collaboration between ourselves, between the Heinrich Pell Foundation and Metropolitan Developmental Agency, uh, generated uh, uh, a social rental agency aiming to address uh, the, the need for access to affordable housing, and in the end of the day, this whole attempt has frozen because the uh, relevant ministry intervened, and now they're trying to implement a particular pilot project uh, because they just have the money for one project. So project-based work, ad hoc initiatives, bypass um, uh, structural work just because there is no political will and not direct competence for issues, emerging issues such as housing. So coordination of various levels uh, is poor and this mainly needs to a situation that our cities are not fit for our current times. And this, their structure, I think, um, tends to reflect realities of the past. It is as if in the global scale there is no uh, climate crisis and as if nationally we have not been through a very long financial crisis that have created new needs and housing is one of them. We keep operating as if uh, everything can be under control in, in the way we kept operating in the past and how serious in the end of the day can we be about transforming the urban landscapes if we keep putting uh, borders uh, in them. And the second aspect is how, of course, decisions flow towards citizens, how are they involved, and uh, the fact is that after the pandemic, we experience an increased interest for information and involvement in issues such as, for example, the management of green uh, areas. Um, in Thessaloniki and in Athens, there has been a movement against the cutting down of trees and uh, a, a wider mobilization of citizens that need to be involved and uh, part of the decision making when it comes to uh, actions that actually change the natural environment in which they operate every day. Providing information coming to citizen participation is indeed a constitutional obligation uh, for uh, state administration at all levels in Greece. The question is how this is actually uh, happening and what comes after that because information is indeed only the first ring in a much, much longer chain and the Greek legal framework uh, for citizen participation, especially after the two major reforms, the one of uh, Kallikratis back in uh, 2010 and Klisthenis in 2018, on paper seems to be rather adequate because one can find tools such as online consultations that Lucas mentioned before, participatory budgeting, neighborhood or the so-called uh, community assemblies, or even local referenda, although this measure it has now been frozen until the end uh, of this term. But the, the challenge and the challenging part comes when uh, we're working in practice. I mean, how does accountability in the end of the day really work? Well, it doesn't. And on, the municipal, on this municipal term has been a rather special one due to the pandemic, and maybe it's not um, a mature decision to evaluate uh, what uh, Clisthenes has brought back in 2018. But the, the overall sentiment is, uh, and there's no doubt that the general uh, sentiment is that there's a big gap between citizen and citizen administrations and the mayors themselves. And there is no better example in Athens than uh, that of Megalos Peripatos, a project that in theory seemed to have ideas in the right direction, but the implementation was uh, such a disaster that it generated disappointment, disapproval, not towards the project itself, but also to the good ideas that it had in it. 
And the same is happening also in Thessaloniki, for example, uh, with the parking lot on Eleftheria Square, a public space of uh, high poly uh, historical importance, especially when it comes to the Jewish past uh, of, hist of uh, Thessaloniki. There, a decision has been made without consulting uh, the citizens, and now, uh, instead of a, a square and a, a park, we have another parking lot, and nobody knows for how long uh, this will remain in this condition. As the level of involvement and commitment and readiness to commit differs from person to person, it is important to deploy uh, complementary tools. We, we had some ideas mentioned today uh, that enable different target groups to be part of participatory processes, deploying a mix of online tools, paper information, public announcement in squares, parks, or even bus stops. There are so many examples all over Europe. Uh, that uh, leads one to, to ask uh, themselves here in Greece why we cannot do such simple things, uh, especially when it comes to uh, actions that change our reality, our everyday lives, like cutting down trees uh, in, in the streets of uh, Thessaloniki or Athens. Um, but I must underline that it is indeed sad not to have, because we're currently a few days ahead of the national elections and a few months ahead of the local and regional elections, that we do not have room for these debates in the electoral campaigns. And um, I, I'm pretty sure that very few people outside this room are talking about these particular issues. We are now in 2023 and we're discussing about our cities in terms of 20 or 30 years ago in terms of governance. So coming to an end with uh, some, so not really solutions, but maybe proposals, uh, the big one is indeed uh, a reform of the role of municipalities, and not in the sense uh, of the ones that we had so far, but taking into account the new reality and equipping them, uh, giving them more responsibilities and equipping them with the right financial and human resources to deal with the new reality. And this, of course, because we're in Greece, is going to be a very long process. But in the meantime, we cannot keep losing uh, more time. So maybe two concrete and more short-term uh, issues and solutions could be um, the creation of a body, both in Thessaloniki and in Athens, that can facilitate the metropolitan coordination and put the conditions in place for greater citizen involvement. I'm not sure if this is indeed what you also had in mind. Uh, Tasso yesterday with a suggestion for a think tank, because I wasn't here for the whole presentation. And the second thing, and we have some examples in Thessaloniki, is we need to push for the creation of physical spaces for meetup between administrations and citizens, places that can actually make it possible that citizens both get the information but are also able to be involved in the decision-making processes. Uh, honest and persistent attempts uh, for participation are required that can, in the end, generate practical examples, practical experiences that can gradually help shift the paradigm in, in Greece. I really found the case of the square that Regina uh, shared yesterday uh, from Munich or the project of Halandri today particularly inspiring, but we need many more tangible projects like that that can create the sentiment that citizens and their voice is actually heard. And coming to an end, my point is that we really have to accept the fact that we're dealing with long-term challenges that go far beyond uh, also the borders of one municipality. Um, so the scale is much different. We need both short-term, easy to implement measures and also long-term policy changes and inclusive strategies of different levels and of the citizens. Adaptation is indeed the first modest step, but what we really need in Greece and in Athens is a socio-ecological transformation and to this end, revising governance, which means also in our case, pushing for a cultural shift uh, is really key. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michali, Dimitri. Just uh, scroll. Please. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Good evening to you all, and thank you a lot for this invitation. In this um, short time, sorry for this delay. Uh, in this short time that I have, I'm going to present some few points uh, based on uh, uh, my contribution in the book launch, but also on the discussion that we had the last, these last uh, two days, focusing more on uh, elements of governance and the planning culture in the case of Athens. Based on my experience as a researcher, but also as a practitioner member of the team of Thimian Papayangis and Associates, um, when we talk about governance and the architecture of institutions, usually it's something uh, 
a bit boring subject, something that we need to, uh, that we don't address it a lot. Uh, that's usually not a subject of uh, the discussion, but uh, I think that in this uh, symposium and in this uh, discussion that we have these days, it's a key element. Uh, what we have seen in these different panels uh, from uh, urban strategies to uh, landscape proposals, uh, from Paris to Barcelona and of course Athens, uh, we have seen different strategies, but as we know, behind every successful urban strategy, there is a very effective mechanism of implementation. And I think this is a key element. From, from Vancouver to Barcelona, there is no single case of urban success story without a governance mechanism that carried it and contributed to the implementation of visionary and um, uh, great projects. So, so I start with this map, which is the first point I want to make. I think that, uh, of course, we are familiar with this image. It's Athens. Uh, we're talking about this um, the, the, this uh, last few days. Uh, we can see uh, how the urban landscape is formed, the boundaries uh, by the two big uh, mountainous areas, of course, the coastal front. Uh, and this is the institutional Athens. Uh, this is a different picture. This is something that is in contrast to what, what we discussed yesterday, is that landscape have no boundaries, but of course, municipalities have boundaries. In uh, Athens, uh, we have uh, 29 municipalities that form the main agglomeration, let's say. And this is the good case scenario, because this is formed in 2010. Before 2010, we had 45 uh, municipalities. And as you can understand, apart from Athens that we can see in the middle and Piraeus, perhaps, all the other entities have very limited resources, uh, small departments that have uh, no main capabilities. And this is, I think, one of the most serious issues that uh, any planning process faces in the metropolitan level. This fragmented, uh, I don't know, Tasso, can I have this kind of, yes, of course. blink laser thing? Okay. Okay, so this fragmented institutional landscape comes along with a very centralized and hierarchical urban governance system in Athens. When I talk Athens, I mean for the whole metropolitan area, area of course. Major urban planning decisions regarding Athens, like the Athens Master Plan or transport policy, are the responsibility of the Greek uh, government through several ministries, government bodies, and uh, the Greek parliament. Furthermore, even decisions at the local level regarding changes in land uses, mobility, and traffic also need the approval of state and regional authorities. Elisabeth yesterday described us with very uh, clearly how in Athens, for example, the whole city center is part of, uh, under the responsibility of the Ministry of Culture. Major urban infrastructure and key roads are actually under the region of Attica, so there is limited uh, uh, possibility of intervention. And this kind of fragmented system also it's kind of multi-stakeholder because you can see different levels in... Oh, sorry, what I have done. Okay. Uh, we can see different levels uh, across mini, uh, central government, local government, and local stakeholders. Uh, the result of this is very, a very weak local government and actually a very weak regional government that uh, besides funding, uh, it has a very limited resources of implementing uh, large-scale projects. Uh, the main stakeholder that influences uh, planning in Athens is actually the central ministries with different departments and their, uh, with different responsibilities. Uh, and in this fragmented system, which uh, uh, a part of uh, also the characteristics of the Greek state and the Greek political system, we have very strong local stakeholders that can actually influence a lot uh, planning proposal and planning initiatives from business elite, developers, but also social movements that are a kind of pressing mechanisms uh, for urban change and urban interventions. Uh, I have to add that in this fragmented um, scene, we have also a very technical dimension in the urban planning process. As a result of the proliferation of engineering sector in Greece, 
linked with design-only based approaches to urban transformation and draw real attention to the social aspects. We have a lack of uh, uh, coherent participation of uh, political scientists in this process. We don't have participation of social scientists in the planning process, very limited. So this creates an attitude, a kind of technical dimension of, of planning. So can the system with these characteristics uh, address the many problems that the, the city will face in the next years and the next decades? Uh, of course, uh, the question is very difficult. Uh, I think that uh, the most important element in this solutions finding process is to understand that contemporary urban problems do not require just the proper technical solutions, but a revision of the values and traditions governing the evolution of urban life and economies in the last decades. Actually, the pandemic shows us that uh, uh, and the lockdowns change our perception of public space and mobility in the city, and this is something that we experienced all in the last uh, two, two years. And most importantly, climate change, adaptation and mitigation policies require also a new social consensus, a new kind of deal with citizens in order to target the transformation of the city. This is extremely important since uh, success in urban planning policy and policy making in general is linked with consensus making and popular legitimacy, particularly in policy that will result in severe changes to the way of life, production, and consumption. In this uh, map, we can see uh, that is a result of the um, uh, research of uh, um, uh, Professor Arapagulu, Maluta, Sayas, and uh, Kara Dimitriou, uh, the housing deprivation and how this has evolved in the last uh, decades, since, since 1991. And actually, this again is a good scenario because we have uh, the data is from previous decades. We're waiting for the results of the new census uh, in the following years. And we can see very clearly that also what are the problems, how we have actually severe problems in this part of the metropolitan area. And it's something that we need to, to address, to discuss, uh, in order to find solutions uh, the next years in an area that will have serious pressures from the tourism industry and uh, uh, development uh, in the metropolitan area of Athens. So I'm going to suggest uh, it's not some it's three, let's say, elements that uh, I think, uh, based on our experience, it's uh, very crucial um, in order to have a transformation, a reformation of the urban planning process and, of course, the governance system in Athens. First of all, and it's something that we discussed a lot uh, these two days and, uh, and yesterday, particularly, we need to find solutions in order to increase participation and citizens' involvement in all the levels of the planning process. This is very important, as issues that require rapid changes in the everyday life habits of and norms of citizens, like climate change, sustainable mobility, uh, this will change the life of thousands of people in the urban area of Athens, and we need to have consensus building mechanisms and uh, to build trust in order for these policies to be successfully implemented. The next uh, point is that we need to rethink uh, how we plan the city. Uh, we need, I think, uh, to be more project-based, more mission-oriented, if I can use the term. The debate in Athens focuses traditionally around the Athens master plan, the regulatory plan. This process also it triggers discussions around strategic decisions. It's very high level, it's abstract, it's time consuming with limited implementation, and usually by the time it's finally approved, circumstances have changed. Although this process is necessary, a more targeted and mission-oriented approach is essential to address pressing issues that demand immediate action and have measurable results. Uh, and of course, we need to define, the, uh, we need a new vision of what an urban project could be. We have heard a lot of ideas, particularly in uh, the previous uh, uh, panel. Um, this is an image, again, of the metropolitan area with the blue and green network. And we can see, and this is part of the Hadrian project that we discussed a lot in, this, uh, in the previous panel. Um, this is the main uh, root of the Hadrian Network, and it's a project that uh, tries 
Again, it's what we call mission-oriented, has a very specific target. It utilizes natural resources and uh, a hidden technical infrastructure. And I think it could be a good example if, of course, we move forward, because this is also something that uh, it's under negotiation, uh, of how a comprehensive and holistic uh, project could be implemented in the metropolitan area. Finally, and I think that this is the the most important part, we need, uh, and the, all these points come actually to that, we need, uh, we need a more capable and efficient administrative and urban governance system that will successfully implement policies and will be able to adapt rapid changes. This is very important. Uh, for example, in the region of Attica in 2022, uh, although the city had the um, uh, Coherent, the city has coherent strategies with uh, Piraeus and Athens uh, proposing projects of around 150 million. Until 2022, only 10% of these projects were implemented. This is a severe problem because it shows that the city as a whole and the region as a whole has, uh, does not have solutions of how to rapidly uh, follow on strategies, on designs. This also has to do with uh, competitions that we talked uh, earlier. There is no path of uh, uh, a clear solution towards implementation of the project. Of course, this requires, uh, in, in my view, a cross-sectoral approach in urban governance and the planning process in Athens. And there is a need also of collaboration between different levers and departments of government from local to central. And this is something that uh, uh, is urgent and needs to be uh, implemented through new institutions. Furthermore, a new relationship is called for between the private and the public sector, one, one of the, which will move beyond the outsourcing of services to a more integrated system. This is also very important and we need to find pathways uh, towards this direction. Finally, policies need to be guaranteed through funding schemes and have clear timetables of implementation and the system that will support and manage this process. Uh, I will finish with his thoughts and uh, looking forward for the discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. And uh, hand over to Katja Stroheka, who will uh, take us out of the Athenian context again to inspire us a bit about the plans of Munich uh, for the future of the city. But Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me for your symposium today. My name is Katja Strohecker. Oops. My name is Katja Strohecker. And what I want today to present you is, so we hope, one day a vision for the city of Munich, a master plan. So um, the so-called Urban Development Plan 2040, it's a brand new plan. And what I want to show you is how it looks like. So that's it, that's me, but there it goes. Perhaps a few words about Munich itself. Munich is a fast-growing city, as you see here on the slide. 2020, we had about 1.58 million inhabitants in a square, in a 310 square meter urban area. And uh, if you compare that to 2040, what the statistics say, in this time, in this uh, 20 years more, we will have, if it's true, 1.85 million inhabitants. Though that means the square kilometers for the urban area does not increase 5,100 inhabitants per square meter compared to nearly 6,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. Maybe you, not everybody of you knows what kind of city Munich is, we are far younger than Athens, that's clear. We are about 860 years old, so in comparison to this town, like a baby or something. But here you see the 14th century, where we were really a small city, nearby to the river of Isa, with a bridge on it. And um, yes, for a long time, we did not grow much at all. 
It started in the 19th century, a little bit more of settlements. Then here it's uh, 1908, yeah, the city gets wider and bigger. But it really started in 1940. I will start up uh, a little bit faster now. 1940, 2000, 2019. And as you can already see, it's very clearly that a city is getting dense, dense, dense. And the fact, the question we have at, as an administration is, what will it look like in 2040? Will it look like that? Is this really something we should reach? Is this really an aim we should long for? So we started to think about an urban development plan, a plan where we can think about how the city will look like in 20 years. We have a long history in Munich, in fact, about um, urban development plans. The first one was uh, 100 years ago, the Staffelbauplan. Then there was one in 1963, in 1983, and the last, um, yeah, the last really map. So it was, there were always maps that shown the whole town. It was an overall view. The last real map was the one of 80, uh, 1983. In the year 1998, it was not possible to have a political agreement to, for a map. So we decided to go further on with a text-based urban development plan, the so-called Munich Perspective. And for 20 years, this was the only thing we had. But as urban planners, you all know that, we were really had the idea we are in need for a plan. We have to tell where things are going to happen. We have to tell where um, nature is developing, where settlements is developing, where, whoops, sorry, where infrastructure is going on. So we decided to make a new plan. The STEP 2040, or how it is called in German, Stadtentwicklungsplan, that's why it's called STEP, the Urban Development Plan 2040. Yes, Munich in 20 years. STEP 2040 draws a picture of the future of our town, and it integrates different fields of action, so different layers on different maps. Um, the fields of action in Munich, they are the connected and green open space, efficient, reliable and climate neutral mobility, strong residential areas and sustainable city development, climate adapted landscape and settlement areas, climate neutral neighborhoods and renewable energy, and communal development of urban regions. So let's have a look in these different fields and I'd like to show you some plans. Yeah, the step 2040 in uh, total. It's not only um, the different fields of actions which are presented in one map, each different field of action, but also a report that summarizes everything. And third thing, as well, a measures and investment plan that more binds the administration to investments that really comes out of these, of these plans. And uh, all together you find it in the internet in the so-called Step Digital. So you can all, uh, everybody who's interested, um, look at the maps, zoom in and really um, yeah, see the details. So our aim is to be able to answer this question I've shown you. How is the city developing? in 20 years? How is the city developing against the backgrounds of the, of the dynamics of the last few years? And how can we deal with the remaining space in the city? In order to set this up as broadly as possible and to achieve acceptance in the city population and politics, this is, I think, a speech about commitment, um, we have developed step 2040 in a really tough participative process. Um, here it uh, says it started uh, in November 2021 until July or last year, but it start started in fact a little bit earlier. In the middle of Corona, there was a kickoff with interested urban society uh, with a live stream. And um, yeah, there were a lot of people discussing what's going on. 
We had exhibitions at the so-called plan treff. These are some rooms we have in our apartment where exhibitions take, plans, uh, take place, where we discuss with the citizens what's going on, where they can get maps and information about everything they want to know about urban planning. And we had a citizens' council, and this was really something new for us. This were a council of 120 randomly selected citizens, but um, we had the aim that they represent the citizens. So that means they were from different age groups, they were from different, different social backgrounds, all these things, and they discussed the urban development, uh, urban development plan, the step, in four days, so they really took their time, they really debated and thought about it, and they found some solutions on, on it. They put their own impulses and proposals and formed a statement. We had, as well, an online participation. This was in two phases. Um, it, uh, they were asked a lot of questions and people could bring their own topics to the whole thing and it went on for two, uh, no, that's not true, for three to four weeks even. So it was, there are really ongoing, um, very intensively discussion. And we had dialogues from the MVHS, which is a, a public educational um, institution. And there were public events, about eight or nine. So they discussed as well different fields of actions and asked the people what their problems, what their challenges are. And as well, what I think is very important, we had a youth dialogue. Because 2040, imagine, do we plan for ourselves or do we plan for our children or grandchildren even? No? So we discussed with young children, with schools, and everybody, and they had really, really good ideas and really good thoughts about how their future should be. And in 2022, we started with the so-called city walks. So um, we went outside on the street, we discussed projects that are in some quarters, and uh, there talk to the people, they could ask questions. And this is really uh, something that is so, um, the people like so much, so we are going on with that, even if it's not only about STEP, but everything else. So this is really a good thing we found out, to really get in contact with the people, because for an administration it's sometimes really hard to address the people, to reach them. The whole process culminated in a so-called conference of the city makers. So um, this was a two-day conference. There were uh, citizens, there were politicians, the administration was there, and much, uh, a lot of experts. And uh, even, um, that was very important for our made uh, a really big uh, thing, there was presented the results of the citizens' dialogue. It was so, um, how do you say that, um, our major liked that so much, so he told the administration he'd like to have that for a lot of more projects. But it was a really, really, uh, yeah, big process, so we will see which... Uh, where we will implement that further on. But it was really good. So this was a, um, a very, really, um, yeah, big participatory process. Um, but uh, to give you a quick example of what the plan looks like, this is the urban development plan, and it was developed from all these forms of participation. It consists of these six layers and uh, represent, represents an overall view. So, um, yeah, what's the aim for us as an administration? Um, we hope that this plan will give us um, a vision for further planning and that all the more detailed planning, all the ongoing projects are invented or results from this plan. So you see there are some kind of clouds in this plan. And all the smaller, more detailed, pro detailed projects um, 
they have to fill, fulfill these, yeah, these clouds. And for us, it was or is very important that this plan is a commitment, a commitment um, not only political wise, but as well from society, from citizens, and uh, from the experts as well. But um, yeah, let's zoom in the fields of action. Um, as I told you, we hope that every field of action, like here, connected in green open space. Um, goes in more detailed plans. So, if we, this is the layer connected open space. And when, you, when we zoom in in this, there is, for example, something called Freiraumquartiers concept. So, you see that it's in the inner city, inner city. And there is another concept, what's called Freiraum Quartiers concept, free space concept for the inner center. And this concept as well contains other projects. For example, just to show you one, the Boulevard Sonnenstraße. What I, well, this is a vision, what um, uh, nowadays, oops, a nowadays really crowded traffic area will hopefully look like in 20 years. But if you could imagine it now, it's a really traffic-depending space. First, it's cars. Second, it's cars. Third, it's, well, public traffic. Um, then it's cyclists, pedestrians, and a little bit of green. And what we hope is to rearrange this, um, yeah, traffic-depending area to a really boulevard with, uh, yeah, leisure places and stuff like that. And um, it hopefully, and you see here a more detailed plan. This is uh, what's going on. And um, this is a political and social, well, discussion um, that's going on, a very heated discussion as well, because you can imagine on the one hand side there are people that say, yeah, that's really good to have more greens in the town. The others say, where will I park my car? So that's always the differences. Um, so it's part of a really heated debate. And it has a lot of resonance. Um, we need to... I make it... Yeah, to yeah, wrap up. I hit, uh, speed up. Yeah, you know, at the same time, we also try to, to, to wake our citizens' appetites with um, the using of public spaces for more than just traffic. Here is the parklet. That means we put away traffic um, 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 parking spaces, two for, uh, for each parklet. So it's a temporary interven intervention. And like you see these two uh, people here for eating ice cream or just spend your time there. Um, but what I told you that we go from a field of action of, of one layer of the plan to more detailed project is not only true for the green part, but it's only uh, it's as well for all the other layers is the same thing. So here, for example, strong residential areas and sustainable city development. Here is the layer for that. From this out comes plants like uh, the Werksviertel with 40 hectares and uh, over 1,000 apartments and 7,000 workplaces. It looks like that. And uh, this year it won the National Urban Planning Award, which we are very proud of. It's in a city like Munich as well, um, building on the outside, see the expansion. But it's, you find this part in the layer of settlements. Sustainability also takes place. And all these different fields of action that I've mentioned go together in this plan, in this uh, all conc uh, concluding uh, yeah, overall view. So this is my last slide, <laughs> because um, this is a work in progress. We had a commitment in society now, we hope so, um, and please, um, yeah, cross your fingers because end of this year or beginning of the next year, we hopefully pass uh, the City Council of Munich and then it might or hopefully will be a vision where all the furthest plans are depending on. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question to each one of you. First of all, thank you for your uh, talk. Um, let's start with Mrs. Uh, Strohecker. Um, I was very impressed by the Citizen Council, an idea that I've never heard of before. Uh, could you please tell us about the challenges that you faced during this whole process, how to engage 120 people of different backgrounds, social economical backgrounds, how do you select people that are actually interested in participating, and in the end, how do you use what all the feedback you get where does it, how, how is this taken into account? Thank you very much. Well, as I said, this was a speech about commitment because as an administration, we cannot implement a plan without the citizens. Um, so for us, it was really important to address them and to reach them. And for an administration, it's always very difficult to reach the people because there are some that are really interested. And as you said, um, the majority is not here today because for them everything else is all right. But we need their opinion because they have thoughts about town. They know where the problems are. They know where the challenges are. And um, that's, yeah, we, with the city council, we really selected uh, over 1,000 people and uh, wrote a letter to them and asked them if they want to be part of this council. In the end, there were 120 people. Um, we were really impressed how deeply they worked on the plan, how really detailed they formed underneath um, teams which one uh, thought about mobility, the other thought about housing, the next said, well, we have to have spaces for leisure time, we have uh, the climate change stuff and all these things. So they really um, had kind of cartas they wrote, um, put that together in a summary, and um, they, were engaged. they were engaged. And in the end, at this conference, they went to the mayor of Munich and told them, that's our plan. We are the city council, so you select politician, politicians, but we are the citizens, and we want to tell you what our aims are, what our wishes are. And the interesting thing was, was that the major really listened to them, that the politicians really um, understood that it's not only experts like we are, like administration are, but that these things, if you discuss them with the people and if they take their time, they understand, they have their ideas. And hopefully, um, well, these people told us at this conference they want to be part until the end. They want to see what's going on in two years, and that's really good. But we need them as multiplicators, because how will we reach the other ones? 120 out of 1.5 million. So that's always a struggle. But I think in this case, we've done a lot, and we hope to reach a lot of people. And how will the city council use their proposals? Well, um, first we had, uh, um, this is the map how it looks like nowadays. It was another map. It was first um, a concept of all experts that Regina Keller was part of it and landscape architects, architects, urban planners elsewhere. And um, we put this map together then we had this process and all the um, belongings of the people, all the um, ideas we tried to implement in this plan. So this is another version already. Um, you see, by the way, I have a few brochures with me because I can't show you all these maps and all these different things. I'm afraid they're in German, but I've laid them outside so you can have a look and see the plans. Um, yeah, this is another version. That's the version with the Citizen Council's ideas. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to uh, Mr. Pulios, you are a, a practicing architect and a city planner. And uh, I very much wonder if you'd like to play minister for a day and uh, 
Since you mentioned all the difficulties that are exist in the different levels of governance, what would be your uh, top priority if you had uh, a month to kill the whole system as it is? You can use my mic. Okay, thank you for the career. this very provocative uh, question. I think that, uh, of course, the solutions are never easy uh, to um, what to do, but I think that the priority for uh, the city of the, the metropolitan Athens, in a way, is to somehow reconstruct uh, what used to be in the 80s and the 90s, the organization of uh, regional plan of Athens, ORSA, as we call it. We need a metropolitan entity that can design, that can lead the uh, ambitious uh, stakeholder consultations that the ones that you are doing in, in Munich, and it's something that we don't have since 2014. And I think that uh, because in the book, but also in the previous conference that we had in Athens, we have Jose Bojigas here. Jose Bojigas is a fantastic urban planner and architect, but also is part of Barcelona Regional, a 35 year old entity Barcelona that is actually responsible for the transformation of the city. And um, I think that if we see every city, we can find an institution that is there to lead planning, lead design, and uh, coordinate this process. And I'm sure that. I don't know what happens in Munich, but I'm sure that you have entities that you plan in metropolitan level, and uh, I think that every city, particularly metro metropolis like Athens, Munich, uh, should have this kind of... So you would go entities. for the recreation of a very strong metropolitan authority, let's say, administration. Okay, Try authority least, is yes. the wrong yes. <laughs> word. No, authority, I think it's better... Uh, what not, it's not an administration, it's something that we need. We need a, a flexible mechanism that can very quickly solve, uh, find solutions, design and propose. Uh, we don't need another authority, actually. Uh, at least uh, we're very, uh, um, I think, years uh, behind uh, doing something that uh, other cities are doing, like Barcelona, where they have recreated the area metropolitana de Barcelona, which is a huge entity, a new authority, combining all the municipalities of the city. I think we need small steps, some small wins in order to see how these things were going to progress. And I think that uh, these kind of institutions are necessary in this process. For the coordination yes. of the... Uh, Mr. Woodis, yes, you'd like to add something. I can give you my mic. We'll work again. I, I was wondering if I'm allowed to play as well, uh, Minister for a Day or whatever we call the game. We are all excited about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who, who isn't? But I would really change the time frame of our conversation because I, I really like what we heard from Munich talking about the plan for 2040. And I mean, we never talk about these issues in Greece over a horizon that goes beyond one electoral term because all these agendas are not attractive, are not sexy enough for the elections. Nobody gets elected with these suggestions and this is highly problematic. So if we really need to be serious and secure continuity, coherence, we heard all these words yesterday, we really need to disconnect these agendas from the electoral agendas and uh, see our city seriously. Whoever is mayor in the next four years, eight years, 12, it doesn't really matter. We need to follow one strategy and the way to make it is as Munich described it, involve as many people as possible, get everybody uh, in line accepting the plan and then the plan can work. So I see uh, you're being um uh, minister for a day, and you're killing the political ambitions of mayors. <laughs> Your number one. Yes, yes, please. Um, you said it's, um, it's not sexy for, for the politicians, and that's a chance. Because then you get a vote on it that's positive. If it's a struggle for the next two years, never. <laughs> okay, so um, the Heinrich Boll Stiftung Institute has done a lot of work 
in various issues that have to do with uh, urban development, <clears throat> among which housing and green spaces and all these. Um, can you please give us your, um, uh, your view on how this strategic planning in Greece has changed over the last decade? I don't think it has really changed. I mean, in a, in a structural way. I think that there are many more initiatives that demand things, grassroots initiatives, most of all. And we have examples, for, uh, for instance, now in Thessaloniki, we have um, a whole discussion about the usage of military camps, former military camps. And around this conversation, we see a lot of citizen initiatives that collaborate with universities, that demand the role around the table with the municipalities. So they de facto create a new structure and they reshuffle a bit the, the way that local decision making can take place. But exactly because the framework is not in place to formally support these new uh, changes, these changes are actually taking place in a very slow pace, in a much slower pace than we would all uh, need them to take place. Okay, um, I think we have run out of time. Oh, we can keep this up. What do you Unfortunately, I mean, if you. Unfortunately. Thank you, uh, I mean, it's, um, yes, I, mean, I don't know if you want to add something yourself as a closing comment or something. No, but I, I, I would like to ask one last thing. Yes. Um, since, we have, uh, since we have you here, it, it would be very interesting to hear, what is the political discussion in the city of Munich around all this change? How are the politicians dealing with it? Is there a political debate? Is, is it something that... Uh, well, the biggest topic is density at the moment and the fear of density. And the discussion is in between, is density something bad? Or is it something we should really reach? Because with density, we can also develop green spaces. So development in total is something good. If we have not only settlements, but green spaces, stuff like that, and that. So that's the main topic of the discussion. And what all politicians see is um, that we are in need to have a vision for Munich and even the region. And what I haven't shown you is a map where we go over the administrative borders, which was very, very sensible because all these other communities around Munich, they have their own uh, city government and all these city governments were really, really not happy that Munich as a big town in the middle um, had a vision for them as well. So it was really sensible to discuss first with the experts and then with the politicians um, outside the administrative borders of Munich. And, um, but even before we invented uh, this plan, um, everybody saw the need in the political discussions that we can't solve the problems of this town only in Munich, that we need our neighbors, and that the admin administrative borders are they are just something on paper, you know. And that yesterday we heard a landscape settlements, they don't end there. So it's a very sensible process. It's very belonging to the people, to the personality of the politicians, but it's growing. It's, I would say, a really small flower at the moment, but it's growing. So um, we invented as well a big, project, the international building um, exhibition, we hope that will take place. And as a city of Munich, the big uh, spider in the middle, we said we go one step back and say it's an exhibition mainly from the region about mobility and we're part of it, but the main topic is the region of Munich and the town. So we try to be always second so that we have the possibility to talk eye for, to eye with the surrounding communities. And that's a big process. 
and that's the topic. We can't solve our problems only here. We have to take uh, the, all the other communities with us and we have to form commitments. Vielen Dank. <laughs> thank you very much. All three of you, and especially thank you, Jorgos Lialios, for joining us. Unfortunately, it's always like this with time, but uh, everybody wants to have a refreshment, I guess, afterwards. So let's move on to our closing comments with uh, Mark Michaeli and Panagiotis Turnikiotis, who will uh, summarize a bit these two days that we heard a lot of ideas. Who wants to start? We have two microphones, by the way. So yeah, so thanks a lot for this last very vivid discussion uh, too. Um, um, I'm always very much into participatory processes, so we want to get with you in dialogue again um, after the party, to say it, so when, when we have some drinks outside. But first we want to wrap up a little bit. And then I, meanwhile, also uh, saw the mayor of Athens joining the show here, so welcome to be here, Mr. Bakoyanis, and I think this is a very good uh, sign that you're really interested, and what Katja Stroecker reported from Munich was actually the intention also to bring in some ideas which uh, could, let's say, add up to what is already there and what is already achieved in essence. And, well, I mean, I'm very much, um, um, as, a, as a scientist, interested in this discussion of uh, killing a system for a day and thinking what could be invented then. But the strange thing about the Munich situation is that the system doesn't have to be killed first because there are so many informal elements which can inform the process, which can, um, let's say, make a, pos a dialogue with its neighboring municipalities uh, happen if you are not start to formalizing everything in the first minute. And that was something which I learned from this discussion, which could be also a, an option for Athens to get in touch with the municipalities and to discuss about, let's say, joint challenges, but also joint possibilities in the future through informal processes. What is a formal and what is an informal process? Uh, we learned a lot throughout these two days. And I'm going back to the title, Transforming Athens' Urban Landscapes. Uh, Athens is changing, uh, is it to be transformed or to be conserved, restored, freezed? We are living in between uh, the shift of uh, change, transformation and conservation. We are a very old city. You said that you are a modern city and we want to be at the same time old and modern, I mean classic and regenerate. Uh, should we change or not? We learned a lot about uh, uh, short-term and long-term planning, uh, small-scale and large-scale, I should say, catalyst planning as well. And then uh, people were asking for a kind of formalized authority to, uh, to uh, formulate uh, the city future. At the same time, we were discussing about uh, informal and fragmentary town planning, putting together differences and contradictions, organizing networks of interventions. And then everybody is complaining about uh, governance. Who is responsible for governance in the city? I guess the mayor. Should we invite the mayor to join us? Why not? Please, join us. We are two professors. Uh, <laughs> two four professors. What they say in German of a professor? Zwei Professoren, Vaterland verloren. That was a Hi. Bismarck thing. Hi. Please try to explain. Hi. Explain what? Uh, the meaning of three professors in... Yeah, three, but <laughs> you're right. You see, I stand corrected. Well, welcome to Athens. Uh, many, many thanks for making this event possible. It's actually quite important for us. And we are grateful, uh, and it's a privilege for me, to join uh, such an exceptional panel. Um, especially, if I may say so, since I'm joining, if you will allow me to say this, Mr. Turnikiotis, who is the wise sage of the city of Athens, we like to say that whatever we do right is because of him, and whatever we do wrong is because of me. So, um, there is indeed 
um, tension in the city, in any city. That's something that we actually have in common with most cities around the world. It's when mayors meet, usually over wine, we talk about the difficulties we face and we always stand surprised that so many of the difficulties we face are actually rather similar, that we face similar challenges and similar problems. And it seems that all around the world, however different the context, the national context, the geographical context, the social context or the economic context, there are three main challenges. Number one, redistributing and liberating quality, public space. Number two, sustainable mobility. And number three, making sure that we change without losing our soul, which basically means mixed land use. We don't get it right all the time, although we do try to get it right. But we are learning from each other, and we have learned a lot from Munich. It couldn't be different. We have been learning since the 19th century. Our National Garden is actually an intellectual gift, and much more than that, of Munich. So let's just get another proof about how when we exchange good practices and we exchange ideas, whether it's the National Garden in the 1840s or whether it's the symposium in the 2020s, uh, good things can happen. Yeah, so uh, thank you to say that you learn a lot from Munich and what we're doing in the moment, or for three years actually, we're now collaborating on this, is offering kind of a knowledge, kind of ideas for pushing it even further. And so um, what we did over the last three years is actually working with scientists, working with students, etc., about new ideas. And I'm particularly interested in how to involve the next generation in this process of discussion through informal elements, participatory elements, spontaneous actions or something like that. And this is something we also heard from some colleagues in particular, for example, in Halandri project, what the potential of this kind of participatory process um, could be. And so we collaborated as old professors, yes, but however we believe in, in, uh, in this new generation of students, etc. so couldn't that be a great idea also to integrate these students in this process of designing the city of the future? Because from the Munich situation, we learned that these participatories don't have to be very formal. However, they can create a lot of things, a lot of ideas, and then we give it back to the experts, and then we are discussing it with the experts what can be done and what can be then executed in formal master plans of the city. Would that be an idea you could pick up? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, one looks at Athens from a distance and it seems big and chaotic. Actually, Athens uh, consists of 129 neighborhoods, and it's all about working bottom up which means that when we go into each and every neighborhood, we make sure we open ourselves to the needs of the people. And our job is essentially to translate these needs, these desires, into real solutions. We are, in a way, conveyor belts. You can imagine us as such. When it comes for bigger projects, we also try to engage in wider Deliberation. For example, you may, I think you heard a bit earlier about a project called the Great Walk. We adopted the methodology, the international methodology of tactical urbanism. Mm -hmm. um, as a result, the project itself at the end will be much better if we hadn't done that. Although clearly we opened ourselves to a wide discussion, which also included a lot of, I'd say, rather constructive criticism and feedback and even pushback. I think this is good. We shouldn't be afraid to take our, let's say, our clothes off in public because the, at the end of the day, what we do is bigger than ourselves and it's certainly bigger uh, than one mayor's term. Just to, to add that you were talking about sustainable mobility and he is teaching sustainable urbanism. Sustainable urbanism, it's much broader. It's put together everything under the umbrella of sustainable life, sustainable city. It's good to think about that. And then we have been collaborating for three years in between academic students, and we have tried, and that's the proof today, to put together municipalities, to put together administration, governance. So we have, we have the uh, head of uh, town planning uh, in Munich and a lot of uh, uh, official uh, administration and, uh, from your municipality. And now we have launched a book, the title of which is 
taking action. Because we introduce the idea that we don't have only to plan, we have to take action. We have to put together real planning, material plan, and that's the book. Oh, Thank you. Would you explain what the book? So the book is the outcome of collaboration. What means people came here, Athens, from Munich, and then we went back to Munich, and we had uh, conferences, colloquia, symposia, uh, in the Technical University of Athens, and out of that, and collecting ideas, uh, that's a kind of uh, bottom-up and the other side as well, th uh, think tank, we have collected essays which are talking about Athens, which are talking about Athens under the title of taking action, because this is what we are advising our governance. Don't collect plans, make them happen, and make them happen together with uh, institutions, we are together with academics, together with the people, and participation. But we are participating as well, we should participate. Our um, collaboration now, thanks. Our collaboration uh, will go on, um, but um, indeed, it's um, the book is not only a book, another book, science book. There are a lot of science reading books. It's, I think, it's a self commitment of a lot of scientists who want to really positively contribute to the city of Essen. So we we collected a lot of, let's say, idea from the international, but they are all, let's say, focusing on the Essen situation. And there are also a lot of students who contributed to it and contributed to other formats here. So I think we definitely should go on with this. My question to you, and this is a very provocative one, I hope you don't mind. When will we talk about Athens as the lighthouse city when it comes to sustainable transformation and not about Copenhagen and Barcelona and Paris? So when will we do it? You do realize that you talk to the mayor. Uh, I'm not at all objective about Athens. It's a professional yeah, 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 perversion. Yeah, yeah, you have a, a I am convinced that Athens is the best city in the world, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm sure for the record. I'm sure but no, having, having said that, look, uh, we have to be very frank and very transparent. We have been through a very, very difficult period. An economic crisis, prolonged economic crisis. It was actually you know, the worst in the history of recorded modern economics in peacetime. But before that, we had our own little mini version of an urban crisis, because two out of five Athenians left the city. Mm -hmm. So now, Athens is not just bouncing back, because somewhere in between we also had a pandemic. We are actually bouncing forward. And I think that I can credibly argue, and this is an objective observation, not a subjective observation, and I can objectively argue uh, in a data-driven way that Athens is right now living its moment. We are breaking a record in terms of investments. We are breaking a record in terms of tourism. We are breaking a record in terms of our public investment program. It's actually, now Georgos Lialios may correct me, but I think it's bigger than the one that preceded the Athens Olympic Games. Having said that, there is so much that remains to be done. But the key here is to talk less and do more. Mm -hmm. what, has, what, what was really striking to me when I first began our term in 2018, and we have the opportunity to discuss it with some of you in this room, was that we found this wonderful, amazing work that filled the drawers. Projects that were thought up by brilliant minds that dedicated priceless hours, days, years of their lives to these, and never materialized, never happened. We made a conscious decision to take them out of the drawers and turn theory into reality. We did it for quite a few projects. Now is the time, and that's why we greatly appreciate your work, and we are very thankful, to open a new circle of thinking about the city. I think so too. Because obviously, challenges have changed. Problems have changed. Mm -hmm. This is a different city than it was back in the year 2000 or in the year 2010 or even in 2020. And we have to make sure we are on the edge 
of thinking so that the rest of us can actually do the work, the work and turn this thinking into reality. Yeah, what a great opportunity now to collaborate with the universities and with the younger generations on this. Therefore, there is no regeneration project. There's generative Athens which is coming forward. We are going to generate Athens which is going forward the future of the city which is based on our past, which is nice to be there, but looking forward, that's the best and that we should try to put together collaborating all of us, I mean designers, a lot of designers here full of competitions and uh, all kinds of stakeholders, but uh, generative means not to regenerate, but to generate. I think it's most important. So, um, there is a lot of ideas in this room, and I have a list of like six pages, uh, ideas which only were uh, developed today, ideas which we will um, bring together in a documentation, and we'll send it also to your office, and I hope that we can go on with the discussion, because um, Regina Keller, who joined us from Munich as a professor of landscape architecture, Welcome. the colleagues from, uh, from New York uh, via the internet today, or from Barcelona in the last, uh, in the last session, they told us there are some very good experiences in really collaborating with students, with the cities, making experimental things, making ephemeral things, which also tie the students very strongly to the city. So they, it's their city. They make the city, they design the city in a thousand projects, and a thousand green deals. And I would be more than happy to come back in some years and seeing that what, what, is, what is coming out of this um, future collaboration between the universities and the city, and then also reporting to the others. The Athenians like their cities, they always did, but now they really use their local talents, this very peculiar social structure. When you look from outside on, on Athens, you're really amazed by the social structure of Athens. So they made something out which is really, really unique. And I hope that we can discuss it a little bit further with the drinks. Let me now thank to all the ones, hundreds of people, which contributed over the last years. It was really a great opportunity. Let me thank you to join it in, in the last much. minute. Thank you, everyone, very, very much. Hope you enjoy your city. Yeah. And I hope... And I hope that you bring also some time with you so that we can discuss a little bit further on outside with the drinks. I know that in, moment, in the moment it's tough times for a politician. A yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's, I know. it's, a, it's a small, <laughs> tiny detail. But you know, we also have a city, <laughs> city to mind. design, so oh, I yeah. take you yeah. serious on this. Okay. But thanks a lot, and I think we had a great event, and let's say from today's discussion, there is still plenty of work to be done. Um, so let's go for it. Do you provide beers from Munich or not? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. So, see you outside. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Thank you so much. This is great.